Good evening, everyone, and welcome to a meeting of Grant County Council of March the 26th, 2024. Attendance has been taken, notice, noticing that Councillor Pierce and Councillor Garneau are not with us tonight. The second thing on the agenda is our land acknowledgement. Councillor Bell, you're going to read that for us, please. I will. As we gather, we acknowledge that we meet on the lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Six Nations of the Grand River, and the traditional territory of the Atiwanderonk. We remind ourselves that the County of Brant is situated on lands that are full of rich Indigenous history and home today to many First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. We recognize the significance of their contributions to the past, present and future of this land. As a county, we have a shared responsibility for the stewardship of the land on which we live and work and a commitment to the truth and reconciliation calls to action. We commit to continue learning, reflecting on our past, and working in allyship. Thank you, you Councillor Bell. Uh, the next thing on the agenda is number three, which is the approval of the agenda, noting that there is an addendum. Councillor Howes. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Oakley that agenda item 10.1 be heard immediately following delegation 5.3. Everyone's okay with that, Councillor Oakley? Yeah, you're seconding that. Councillor Miller? Well, I was gonna add uh, one item under other businesses. Okay. And you'll let us know what that is when we get there. Anything else, uh, Councillor Oakley and then Councillor Kyle? Um, that uh, item 12.2 be heard immediately following 5.6 as well. Thank you. Councillor Kyle. Okay, I have one item under new business to add as well. I promise it will be brief. All right. Thank you. So we'll take a vote on the uh, agenda as modified and with the addendum. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Number four on the agenda is the declaration of pecuniary interest. If you have one, please let me know which takes us to number five on the agenda, which is the delegations. Um, the first delegation, um, Brooklyn has uh, withdrawn her delegation, which takes us to 2.5, I'm sorry, 5.2, and that's Matt, Mark, and Malcolm. Someone here to speak to, that's you? If you'd like to come to the podium, please. You have 10 minutes to speak to us, and then we're going to answer every question that you can possibly imagine. <clears throat> Good evening. Firstly, we want to thank you for taking the time with us here today. We understand everyone's very busy and appreciate this forum is intended for vital community discussions. So we're very grateful for your time and considerations in hearing us out. Please allow me to start by introducing my team and I. We are the production team from MHTV Canada Inc., representing a television series called Motorheads being produced for Amazon. With me today is our producer, Matt Code, and our two location managers, Malcolm McCullough and Mark Eileen, as well as their associate, Coralie Lott who some of you may already know, as she's been spending quite a bit of time in Paris these last few weeks. My name is Ashley Shields-Muir, and I am the show's unit production manager. I have to tell you, outside of this being a job I quite enjoy in an industry I very much love, I'm particularly excited to be here today to discuss our partnership with the town of Paris and the county of Brant. I was born and raised in Brantford and have spent countless summer days of my life working as a camp counselor at the Silap Center attending the Paris Fair, and swimming at the Paris Pool. So the idea of this community representing our story's hero location makes me very proud. Allow me to start by telling you a little bit about our show. Our story begins with New Yorkers Zach and Caitlin moving to the small town of Ironwood, where their mother grew up and their father made a name for himself as the racing legend turned fugitive. The two are faced with the challenges of a high school social life and the unfavorable reputation of their father that he left behind. Muscle cars are the currency in this town, and 
the backdrop to the journey Zach and Caitlin are on to redefine their family name, discover who they are, and prove to their friends and foes that they belong. Our team has been working incredibly hard for the last year or so, scouting this picturesque town and surrounding area, and beginning the process of forming strong relationships with you and your small businesses. And everyone from our shows to creator to our partners at Amazon have all agreed. Paris contains all of the qualities we're looking for to represent our story's town of Ironwood. As such, Mark and Malcolm have been working vigorously putting together the specific asks of your neighborhoods and residents. This includes approximately five different filming visits of varying scales between April and July of this year. Each visit will accompany a different list of requests and permissions, location specific, time of day, stunts versus dialogue only, all details which will continue to be methodically itemized and coordinated with you. Typically, each filming request will come with prep and wrap days on either side. For those of you who haven't had the experience of working with the film and television community before, I'd like to walk through some of the fiscal contributions we're endeavoring towards with the county and local businesses. When working in a community, we typically offer three types of location fees for people and businesses who would agree to partner with us. The first is the location filming the filming location fee. This is a fee where we pay individuals or businesses to access their properties for filming purposes. Imagine some of your favorite TV shows, the castles in Game of Thrones, the Victorian homes in Handmaid's Tale, the restaurant in The Bear. Many of these places are real life locations for production's filming needs. The second is an access fee. These are circumstances where we aren't asking to film on your property, but your, height, your house might not be in the movie, but it's almost more important. We're asking potentially for access to your property, use of your driveway, entrance to your exterior property, access to your yard, things like that. Lastly is my favorite titled fee, and this is called the inconvenience fee. These are fees which acknowledge that our presence as a crew or unit may present or create challenges and circumstances for you or your business or the association. With this in mind, we often negotiate a fee based on a loss of business, a loss of access, and inconvenience. In this specific example, we usually ask to look at receipts from within the last year or the last week to determine appropriate fees for lost businesses, et cetera, and, and we can absolutely speak more about that. In our evaluation currently, we are estimating our average spend per day of filming to be around $100,000 in location-related rentals and ancillary costs with an additional $50,000 in hotels or per diems. Essentially, through fees, rentals, hotels, and food purchases, we're estimating spending approximately $2 million over the course of the season. Furthermore, the above are projections on negotiated fees for doing business. However, in addition to this, we've also been actively considering ways where we can bring money back to local businesses while we're actually here working, whether this be via the coffee orders at the Dog Ear Cafe, of which we have frequented already several times, or double scoops at the What the Scoop, or lunches and dinners from any of the various delicious spots on Grand River Street North. I can imagine this might sound a bit overwhelming if this is the first time working with our industry, but I can assure you that our team, led by these really fine humans behind me here, have been working tirelessly to ensure that this experience be the least disruptive and most collaborative as possible, all while working within the framework and infrastructure for notifications, insurance, and payment structures you've been requesting. And while we won't ask or suggest that we be the only show you consider working with over the summer, we do hope that you'd consider keeping us closely informed in the event that another production were to inquire about filming here. This is less about us selfishly wanting to withhold the creative and uh, beautiful locale and more about wanting to protect our reputation with you, while also facilitating the easiest and most positive experience for you, because we can't necessarily control the behavior of other productions and their crews but we can ours. And what I can do is I can personally assure you that the cast and crew of Motorheads will come to work in your community with respect, with professionalism, and with a real gratitude for the privilege of telling our stories in your backyard in partnership with your council, your local business owners, and your families. We really thank you for your time this evening. We look forward to answering any questions you may have, and I look forward to spending another summer in Paris. Thank you, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, council, do you have any questions? Councilor Howes, you're first. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through, uh, to uh, the group. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for keeping everyone informed beyond just our, our film department. Uh, it's nice for, for the public to learn more about this uh, to a point. 
Um, with your plans for filming on Grand River Street North, will that necessitate closing the road? And and one thing, if I could just clarify, I, and you probably said it at the beginning, but I might have missed it. it. Is it a movie or is it a series? Okay, thanks. Oh, I have to keep my finger. So, um, sorry, and I'm not sure your mic is on. Um, it, so it, it, it may necessitate closing down. You're, you're working with our rel um, relevant departments. Um, and if the road does have to be closed, you're looking at kind of afternoon into evening. Right now we're scheduled for a 4 p.m. Uh, closure on the Tuesday and the Wednesday. Sorry. Yes, uh, we're Thank you for the details. You, you've been around town enough to know we, we already have a bottleneck, so we, we appreciate uh, how you're respecting that. Thank you. One We won't necessarily always have to close the road. Like some visits, we may not. It'll be a case by case each time, and we'll work with you to try and uh, facilitate a, you know, whatever is convenient for both sides. But occasionally, we will need to close roads for sure. Any other questions for the delegation? Councillor Kyle. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Through you to the delegation. Just um, wondering, you mentioned that you've been um, working and building relationships with the different business owners and residents that you might be impacting. Just wondering if you could give us a general sense of what that reception has been like. Are they positive? Are they concerned? Um, what types of feedback? Certainly. I'm going to let Coralie speak to that because she's been really boots on the ground here. So for the last couple of days, Malcolm and I were, last week we went, where's the button? It's on, yeah. Oh, is it? Nice. Sure. Sorry, thank you. Uh, we went and visited individually each business along. We left our business cards so that any business would know to call, to call us as well as Mark. And uh, we're going to be working on the resident uh, areas as well, uh, just so when we do have some lighting setups, if there is an issue with someone's window being lit up, they can call me and I will come and uh, assist them uh, with, with blocking out the windows. There's lots of ways that we can we can work with everyone. Um, so I, I'm, we're still in some of the early, early stages, but most of the businesses do have uh, our number and I always pop in, you know, I've been on the street several times a week. So we will, we will continue that. I will be the point person for Paris consistently through all of our visits, so they only have to deal uh, with me between both of, of, of the managers. And Olga and Coralie have been working tirelessly to try to figure out all of our requests because they are uh, far and few between. Each visit will be different. But uh, for example, sometimes it's it's roadside. Sometimes we have planters that we've been wanting to try to take away. And they've been working to try to see what can be done and what can't be. And doing the newspaper idea was working but we want to make sure that all of the visit, the, the more of the residents that are near the downtown, on those two days, the April 16th, 17th, there will be two lights that are uh, brightening up that downtown strip. So we want to make sure that we're getting boots on the ground closer to those people's houses so we can let everyone know. And we're going to do that by notification letter that Olga and Coralie are still working on. Any Lucas, uh, Councillor Oakley. Uh, through the mayor to the president, or to the pres uh, geez, to the delegate. Um, I'm the uh, rep council representative on the Paris BIA board. Uh, have you had the opportunity to meet with them? Um, okay, excellent. Um, so, uh, in that regard, to, um, 
sorry, I'm having a, a moment here. My apologies. Um, I'll have to, to uh, defer to them in, in, in regards to closing the business down here and, and what they'll need from there. Um, I actually at one point had, uh, with the previous employer, had the opportunity to work on a different Amazon series. So I am familiar with both the benefit and challenges that can come from, from filming. Um, so I will have to uh, leave it to them on to determine one way or another whether or not it will be of benefit to the downtown. And, and I'm very happy that you guys have already reached out. So thank you. Oh, and, and just to be clear, we haven't asked any business to close at this point. We are we are really trying to work out the parameters of our closures for each visit still. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, thank you. As you know, probably uh, the County of Brant has had very good luck with uh, movie productions, uh, with Handmaid's Tale and many Murdoch mysteries and Hallmark movies and all kinds of... So the, the bar is very high for your behavior. <laughs> and we are watching you from every angle. So th thank you very much, and thank you for choosing the County of Brant, and I wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much. much. Council, what do you want to do with the delegation? Councillor House? Um, just move to receive as information. Thank you. Seeking a seconder? Councillor Coleman? All those in favor? Opposed and carried. Thank you. Uh, the next delegation to come up is... Oh, it's culture. It's you. It's All right, thank you. I'm just going to give a little introduction, and I see Emma is on our screen, and she'll be sharing her screen here. Yes. Yep. Perfect. All those in favor of extra time if needed. Opposed? You have extra time if needed. Thank you. All right. So we received direction from the council to pursue uh, the arts, culture, and heritage strategy, and we're really pleased to bring that to you tonight. This strategy was informed by research and innovative community engagement, which allowed us to craft a really branch-specific plan. Through our conversations, we heard about the appreciation for our unique, tangible, and intangible cultural heritage assets, and that the county is defined by our history through local heritage, museums, archives, historic buildings, festivals, foods, and local traditions. We are also defined by our contemporary culture, artists, and art venues, film, music, crafts, and community connections. The economic and social benefits of culture are well recognized worldwide. Culture brings people together. It builds social bonds, creating a sense of place and community pride, as well as fostering understanding and respect for each other. We engaged ERA Architects in May 2023 to help us craft this new strategy. They are well-respected consultants who have ex an extensive resume of working with a multitude of cultural and heritage projects, from the ROM to the National Arts Centre, Chiefswood, Dunder and Castle, Union Station, Heritage Conservation District, and several smaller municipal projects. I would like to now uh, welcome Emma, who you can see on your screens. Um, she'll be presenting here um, a nice overview of our strategy, and then Zach and myself will come back up to do some uh, questions and answers with Emma. So I will let Emma take it away. Thank you. Oh, I think you're on mute. So Thank you so much. Uh, here I am. Can everyone hear me and see my screen? Yes. All right, perfect. Then thank you so much, Kayla. And good evening to all of you. My name is Emma Abramowitz from ERI Architects, and I'm very excited to be here tonight to report on the final Brandt Arts, Culture, and Heritage Strategy. And I'm going to aim to give as brief as possible an overview of the strategy tonight. First, I'll provide some background on the project. Then I'll provide an overview of what's included in the strategy, and then we'll move into questions and discussion. So just to start, as mentioned here, um, I'm from here from ERA Architects. We're a heritage consulting firm focused on conservation through reactivation. A big part of our practice is focused on how physical buildings and landscapes intersect with intangible practices, traditions, events, and activities to foster cultural identities. And that's a lens that we've really applied throughout this project, as you'll see once we get into it. As I mentioned, um, we began this project in June 2023. 
We spent the first couple of months gathering and reviewing information and getting ready to launch a public engagement period, which ran for two months between August and October. We then took everything we learned and developed the arts, culture, and heritage strategy, which has seen three drafts circulated to staff and community stakeholders and refined until we've ended up with a final strategy today. The final arts, culture, and heritage strategy reflects a robust public engagement pro process that happened not just during that two-month public engagement period in Salmon, but through the full span of the strategy's development. To start, we engaged a 12-member steering committee to help us shape the strategy. Representatives were invited from all sectors of Brant's arts, culture, and heritage industries. We were really very fortunate to get to solicit the expertise of a really diverse group of people across a range of disciplines, age groups, and perspectives. The steering committee joined us at three juncture points, a kickoff needing to speak broadly about what they felt was needed in arts, culture, and heritage, a feedback meeting in October to provide context on what we heard throughout all of the rest of public engagement, and then they had the opportunity to review and provide comment on draft number two of the strategy. We also reached out at the outset to local Indigenous rights holders, including representatives from the Six Nations of the Grand River, the Woodland Cultural Center, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. We sought their feedback on if and how they were interested in being engaged on this project, and we heard back that there was a preference to review and comment on the draft strategy as it was developed. So that engagement really happened throughout December and January, and it informed the third and final drafts of the strategy. Finally, in August to September, we ran a multi-pronged public engagement period, which included interactive public engagement boards at various community events all throughout the county last summer, an online survey that received 53 public responses and nine responses from arts, culture, and heritage professionals, and then finally, a well-attended arts, culture, and heritage party at the Wincy Mills in September, where we hosted a number of activities, including a cultural mapping exercise. Based on this robust engagement process, we're confident that the strategy you have before you today meaningfully reflects the voices of engaged stakeholders throughout the County of Brant. So now I'll move into giving you an overview of what that strategy looks like. This is the table of contents for the strategy. It's broken into three chapters, some background, then the strategy itself, and then the approach to implementation. In the background section, we cover questions like why the county's developed an arts, culture, and heritage strategy. And the answer is really to provide a framework to help reestablish community linkages and continue to foster a shared cultural identity. We talk about the existing and growing momentum in Brant's cultural sectors so that we understand exactly what it is that the strategy is designed to support and continue to foster. And we share the cultural mapping we undertook to understand where Brant's cultural facilities and activities are currently located at this moment in time, recognizing that they're all in a process of growth and change. The front end of the strategy continue, concludes with all this information on the existing conditions, including results of public engagement, synthesized into a SWOT analysis. There's much more in the strategy, but I've just pulled a few examples of these strengths, uh, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats here to just give you a flavor of the types of successes and issues that were flagged. Strengths include, but are not limited to, annual events like the Burford Fair, the new arts, culture, and heritage officer position, engaged stakeholder communities and unique built heritage resources. Weaknesses include limited resources that are inhibiting heritage planning and conservation, difficulties in accessing grant funding, long-time arts, culture, and heritage stakeholders being sometimes slower to adapt to contemporary best practices in their fields, and red tape sometimes inhibiting the grassroots delivery of new programs from that very active and engaged stakeholder community. Opportunities include new residents who are bringing innovative approaches, new ideas, and energy to the sector, heritage conservation and promotion as a potential driver for economic development, and the potential for new incoming development to be leveraged to create more spaces for arts and culture. And threats include time pressures from the Ontario Heritage Act that will make limited heritage planning resources even more problematic, potentially leading to the loss of important historic resources, the impact of development pressure on affordable living and working spaces for artists, and the potential for a focus on tourists to detract from programs, events, and activities that prioritize locals. So then at the conclusion of the engagement period, we studied this summary SWOT analysis, and we extrapolated from it a vision for Brant's arts, culture, and heritage sectors, a set of six objectives to fulfill the vision, 
and then a set of specific actions under each objective, and there are 42 in total, that would achieve the objectives. That's really the meat of the strategy, and so I'm going to start by walking you through that foundational vision. The County of Brant is a cultural landscape, reflecting the interplay between its physical context and long-standing and ongoing cultural practices, traditions, events, and activities. This strategy lays out a vision for the conservation, celebration, and amplification of these specific physical elements and the activities that occur on and within them that shape Brant's culture and make this place unique. The County of Brant will become a leader in attracting and supporting diverse artists, performers, musicians, artisans, cultural producers, and their audiences. The county's increasingly dynamic mix of arts organizations, cultural programs, and destinations will enrich the lives of residents and visitors. Brant's burgeoning grassroots arts, culture, and heritage communities will continue to grow and become more connected and coordinated, supported by centralized services and supports. Brant's built and natural heritage resources will be proactively conserved for future generations by the county. Joint stewardship of traditions, practices, and events will catalyze inclusive and diverse storytelling about Brant's past, present, and future. The county will model best practices and heritage conservation for county-owned cultural heritage resources. And then finally, the county's efforts in this space will be supported by respectful collaborative relationships with its neighbors, including the city of Brantford, the Six Nations of the Grand River, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Now, as mentioned, this vision is to be fulfilled through six objectives, and those objectives can be achieved through 42 actions. That's really the substance of the strategy. At the right side of the page, you can see the toolbox of actions. The type of actions range from new policies and processes to guides and resources to promotion. I'm now going to walk through each of the six objectives. And on the screen for each one, you'll see summary bullets of each of the actions below it. And I'll mention a few of them, but I'm not going to read them all. It's all in the strategy in a lot more detail. Um, but we'll just try to review some examples here tonight to get a flavor of things. So to start, Objective A is to support truth and reconciliation through arts, culture, and heritage initiatives in connection with broader municipal reconciliation programs. This first objective is different from all the others because it actually only includes one action, which is to meet with Indigenous rights holders and partners to define a set of actions to achieve Objective A. The premise of this is that it's really not up to us to develop a set of strategies for reconciliation on our own. The whole premise of reconciliation being that we're working together, developing and growing relationships across jurisdictions, rebuilding trust, and providing the space for Indigenous communities to determine what actions would best support reconciliation in the arts, culture, and heritage spheres and brand. But just to get the conversation started, we've provided some examples of the types of activities that might be helpful to formalize into actions once that collaboration begins, including, for example, streamlining their access to places for ceremony, like along the Grand River, training for municipal committees on the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which is a foundational document that everyone should understand, and developing programs and initiatives that celebrate and amplify Indigenous languages. The next step on this objective is to continue to meet with Indigenous rights holders and partners to develop a set of real actions together. Now, objective B is one that's full of actions. It's actually got the most. The objective is to provide an infrastructure of support for individuals, institutions, businesses, and organizations undertaking cultural activities. The purpose of this objective is to recognize that so much of Brant's arts, culture, and heritage activities comes from the grassroots level, and instead of trying to take over that provision, the most helpful thing the county can do is to develop an infrastructure of support for all those people and organizations who are doing amazing things already, and so that we can facilitate more of that type of activity in the future. So these actions are mostly for the arts, culture, and heritage officer, and they include things like producing a guide to culture grants to help people access them, to maintain a cultural space database so that organizations have a central resource to consult when they need space for their programs, and to streamline the special events application so it's easier for people to plan and deliver cultural events. Objective C is to facilitate a spoken wheel model to support and promote the diverse, vibrant cultural activities occurring both within a central cultural hub and countywide throughout Brant. This objective is intended to acknowledge that downtown Paris is a destination with a hub of historic resources, cultural businesses, and cultural programming. And that instead of pulling the focus, its role as a destination can be leveraged to make it a jumping off point for the equally exciting and important programming that's happening throughout the rest of Brant, 
We just need some infrastructure in place to make it happen. So, for example, the development and enhancement of a bikeable culture trail connecting the historic settlements, an annual culture map directing visitors and their spending money to locations throughout the county, and events like art crawls that might start in Paris but expand throughout. Objective D is to foster a broadly inclusive cultural sector that supports residents and reflects their diverse experiences, perspectives, and cultural traditions. In this objective, we're thinking about inclusion in many different ways. So it includes actions targeted around universal accessibility, support for programming for newer or underrepresented cultural communities in Brant, and affordability to continue working in cultural industries as housing costs and commercial rents may be rising. Objective E, um, we've got two more here. Objective E is to conserve and celebrate Brant's unique buildings, landscapes, and stories as cultural heritage assets. The idea being that tangible and intangible heritage um, is an important part of Brant's cultural identity and it can be conserved and promoted in many different ways, including by pursuing heritage designations, engaging an annual research intern to help with the substance of work involved in those designations, and developing a heritage award for great conservation projects, but also through countywide initiatives like a public art and heritage interpretation plan so we can tell the stories of Brant's history and identity physically in the public realm. One action here that you'll see at the top right is to explore mechanisms for the conservation of area-wide historic character. This could include heritage conservation districts, but the action also acknowledges that sometimes there are different and better methods to conserve area-wide character. The strategy provides some direction around what tools are most appropriate when. And then lastly, objective F is to standardize municipal heritage planning practice with the Ontario Heritage Act and with municipal best practices across Ontario. This objective acknowledges the fact that although we're looking at arts, culture, and heritage as many facets of a broad cultural planning strategy, heritage conservation is actually legally regulated by the Ontario Heritage Act. So there are processes, timelines, and expectations that really need to be met in a way that's less the case for the rest of the work described in the strategy. An important thing to note here is that while a lot of the strategy falls under the purview of the arts, culture, and heritage officer, those legal processes and timelines around heritage conservation are really the scope of development services and particularly policy planning. So this first action is actually about delineating the difference between those two, who's responsible for what. Then there are a series of actions around how development services um, can meet the expectations in Ontario's heritage planning framework, particularly given that those expectations were just intensified in the last year. So, for example, there's an important action around investing in additional staff to properly administer the heritage planning portfolio. By necessity, this section is a little more technical than the rest of the plan, because the goal is to make sure that built heritage conservation can happen effectively as one of the many prongs of supporting and fostering cultural identity and brand. So then the strategy is also peppered with precedents throughout all the objectives to kind of share how other communities are tackling similar actions. So I'm just showing a couple of examples of what those precedent pages look like here. And then the final section addresses how to implement the strategy and in particular the 42 actions. An implementation table is provided that identifies the recommended timeline, anticipated financial investment and department responsible for each action. Here's what that implementation table looks like in the back end of the strategy. And the section also clearly identifies that the majority of the actions can be undertaken with existing staff resources, but that there are a few actions, 10 in particular, that would require additional staff resources in order to be properly implemented. And then a couple more that can be implemented with current resources, but would be more effectively completed with additional staff. All of this in the implementation section is identified for the purposes of information, so that the county can proceed to make informed decisions about the implementation of all 42 actions over the coming decade. So uh, that's a brief overview of the strategy that I just sped through. Um, I hope it was helpful and I'm happy to answer any questions from council and maybe Kayla and Zach will also return up to the podium to answer some of those questions with you. Well, thank you for your presentation. Um, does council wanna ask questions to the presentation or to staff? Are there any to the presenter, Councillor House? Okay, I, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I will, uh, I will ask a question of Emma, um, and then I do have questions for staff after, at the appropriate time. Um, but I'm wondering, Emma, could you, could you, you did speak in, in fair detail about option C, that, um, or section C with the spoken wheel uh, uh, 
illustration, but I'm wondering if, if you could speak a little bit more to that and, and kind of walk us through what that might look like in a little bit more detail. And I'm thinking more for there, there, there are people who will be watching this video and, and, and asking us questions later. And, and this is a, that reference is something that not everyone is going to immediately understand. Right. Yeah, I can I can certainly expand on that a little. Um, I think that what became really clear to us as we were as we were undertaking our kind of public engagement processes and, and learning more about Brandt is that there is so much robust activity happening everywhere throughout Brandt, and um, it also sort of felt clear that from the outside, um, Paris gets a lot of focus in part because it's sort of. You know, I think that the ways that it's been kind of promoted externally um, from other places have maybe been a little bit different. It also does, you know, we want to acknowledge that it does have kind of a concentration of, um, you know, buildings occupied by cultural institutions or cultural businesses that, that do, in fact, draw people. And because there's a concentration, they're drawing people. So we we don't see that as a detriment to um all of the you know really vibrant cultural activity that's happening outside of paris we actually just think that that there's an opportunity to use the fact that paris is drawing i think visitors in particular um and use that as a moment to kind of to spread people out so you know some models we look to are places that have you know when i talk about a culture trail um i'm talking about the idea that there can be kind of um, bike tourism, where there are kind of trails and markers that people can can plot their routes in ways that bring them to other kind of um, settlement areas and hubs as well, or kind of um, planned and promoted events that are framed as kind of crawls throughout the various places in the community that, you know, if Paris is in fact drawing people, and that's something that that other communities are interested in attracting as well, that, that we can just leverage that interest. Thank you. Councillor Miller. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and this is uh, three, Mr. Mayor, two, Emma. Um, Emma, I read, the, I read your report, and I still can't answer the question, um, so maybe you can help me. Uh, but in regards to arts, culture, and heritage, what's the government's role? Is it, is it to lead or is it to support? That's a really, really great question. And it's something that, um, that, that, I think there's a balance. It's something that we are kind of working through as well as we're developing it. And I think objective B in particular is really centered on the idea that that there, there is so much that's happening at the grassroots level and there is such an engaged community that the idea of kind of stepping into lead is maybe sometimes almost disengaging and counterproductive and that instead of taking a leadership role, we can take a facilitation role or, or government can take a facilitation role. So to be there as a support and a facilitator for things that are being driven at a community level, particularly when there's so much engagement and so much of it right now. Okay, so um, <laughs> it sounds like uh, sometimes we can lead and sometimes we can support, depending on the situation. Okay, that sounds thank right. You. Yeah. Councillor Bell. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to Emma. Emma, um, I'm not used to seeing a, a vision statement that runs to five complete sentences and probably 120, 150 words. In my world, a, a vision statement is something which is memorable and short. Can you give thought to condensing that to something which we as councillors can actually remember and, and share? Uh, I don't doubt the content, but I think it's just difficult for us to tell the story. It's a very complex story. It, it, there's a lot of words in your report. There are a lot of actions. Um, I, I find it difficult to connect at the moment. Uh, um, and I, I look to you and to Kayla and, and, and to Zach to simplify it, give us something that we can hang on to more, more readily. I, so I think maybe I'll I'll defer to to Kayla and Zach about kind of the the scope for um, for revision. Certainly, I definitely I, I completely hear you, um, and I think that the the vision can certainly be kind of condensed into a smaller package to kind of be distributed and and in the way that the strategy is kind of talked about throughout Brandt. Um, there's definitely a way to condense it a little bit further into something a little more bite sized. 
Yeah, and I might just add to that, we have discussed creating like a postcard kind of summary with those high points um, to hand out to people so that it is that really quick bite. You can look for more information in there, but these are the main points that we're really trying to get through. So we could look to the vision statement to start that that piece and maybe do some editing to it as well. To put in there. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Howard, you're next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, I, I will ask a question of staff then. Um, I've always envisioned that the, the role of the arts, culture, and heritage officer, I, I've envisioned it as one that is pulled in a lot of different directions. So my question to Kayla specifically is, does this master plan, if approved, help narrow down priorities for you? Yes, it does. Yeah, we were very thoughtful of that and the implementation. Um, and just, I see this as a blueprint for my role that I haven't necessarily had, um, but it's been a good point because I've been here for two years to really think about what that should look like. Um, and speaking with ERA as well has been really helpful because they are leaders in this as well. I think the biggest piece that helps is that delineation between role, roles for what is legislated and what is not as well. And I think that's gonna be really helpful moving forward. Um, we didn't put anything in here that isn't attainable. And I think looking at it as a 10 year plan is really helpful too, to really scale out as we'll um, be able to build these building blocks. Um, so I think it really is an attainable plan that has a lot of on the ground actions. And I think that's really helpful for my role as a blueprint because um, it is a lot of different things, but I do think it all connects to that storytelling piece. And there is a lot of connections even between each of the actions and objectives. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Kyle. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Through you to either Emma or Kayla, Zach, whoever um, <laughs> is, is most equipped to answer the question. But um, one of the things I noted having read through the report um, and then listen to Emma's presentation, is that in objective B, we talk about the um, collaborating directly with regional neighbors, but the only ones that are mentioned are Brantford and Six Nations. So I'm just wondering, especially if we're talking about um, something like reconciliation, we have other regional neighbors along the, the, the Grand. For example, we have North Thumfries and Cambridge. Um, you know, next door we have Hamilton, we've got Oxford to the west. So I'm just wondering how some of those other regional neighbors are, were factored into the report and how you might see those collaborations as well. Um, no, I think that's a really good point and we did discuss that. I think Brantford, Six Nations, Mississaugas were really obvious ones while we were developing this because um, you'll know as well that we've discussed beginning an arts council and that's already started and it's been really with those groups because we've noticed even with our stakeholder and our community engagement, culture doesn't necessarily see borders. So there's a lot of artists that live and work in both communities. Um, so that one's been a really natural piece. Um, but having said that, I do quite often speak to a lot of communities beyond just those neighboring ones. Um, to see best practices. I know even that was where we started with this plan is seeing what other communities similar to us, close to us um, are doing. So there is gonna be a lot of connections with that and learning. Um, there's some really good networks, the Creative City Network that I'm part of as well. And that's working with a lot of these communities beyond. Um, so I think there is a lot of information sharing, um, learning, especially with things like Bill 23 that has had a lot of change in the last year. We've been really working together. Um, so I would say those ones are more kind of those cultural sharing um, immediately kind of back and forth with their borders, but I do think that does expand to other neighbors as well through the work that I'm doing. That is a good question. I don't know if you have anything to add. Uh, through the mayor, I, I don't know if I have much to add that other than kind of the immediate need seemed to be with Brantford and, and Six Nations. And, you know, once we uh, figure out a good way to collaborate, you know, we can certainly just continue to work with our neighbors. Thanks, uh, uh, Councillor Chambers, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and through you to the uh, presenter, whoever they may be. I, I'm, I was caught uh, uh, on the vision page that, that Councillor Bell was uh, referring to, and my eyes caught something a little bit different, and that is the picture on the uh, on the page. And I don't know whether you can flash it up there or not, but. Uh, the, the, the picture there that actually is reproduced five times 
is actually not a picture of a, a great architectural wonder or a museum or anything else. Uh, it's a picture of a farm. I'm not sure that that farm is in Brant County, but uh, might. Yeah, it is. I took the picture, so yes, it is in the so county. So I can't, you, you have to speak louder and clearer? It is in the county. I can, can right. yes, I took uh, the pictures. <laughs> then, oh, okay, it is Larry Davis's farm. Cecil Davis's, as I know it. And, uh, uh, so I'm just wondering, looking at that picture, and growing up and, and, and having a great uh, historical background of six generations on farms in the uh, uh, county, what parts of the heritage uh, master plan is devoted to that, the agricultural heritage and, and the, the, the rural uh, uh, background that many of us have in, in the uh, county? I don't see a lot of that. Uh, in, in the uh, plan. I, I can maybe speak to that a little bit, and thank you so much for the question. Um, I, I talked a lot about the idea of both tangible and intangible heritage, and um, for us, when we kind of, as heritage consultants, when we're asked to study farms and, um, you know, we're, we're often asked about what does this place look like right now? What's the kind of physical feature? And and um, for us, what we also want to be talking about is is actually, you know, the economic and cultural and social heritage of agriculture and the way that the way that agriculture as an industry has has shaped people's communities and histories. Um, so so that's part of it. And so part of it is when there are events that are that are kind of centered around kind of agricultural sectors um, that you know like like agricultural fairs like apple fest etc that that those are ways to promote agricultural heritage and, and culture as a key kind of defining element of of brant's cultural identity um another one that i i didn't really get into but it's in objective e which is around kind of conserving tangible and intangible heritage um is about the development of local historic context statements which is when um, the county kind of works with with more um, individual communities to determine kind of what's of value and what are the kind of key features that convey that value in their local community. And so that's the type of action where, where when there are you know landmark farms that really are 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 defining features of a place that they can be flagged for you know conservation or flagged for, um, you know, support, programmatic support. Um, that's, you know, it, it gets into it a little bit in the strategy. I hope that's helpful. If, if I could just uh, offer a follow-up and and, uh, and I understand and, and appreciate what you're saying. And, and all too often, uh, and actually television shows do this all the time, the, uh, the action, all the action, neat action happens in the towns and the cities and then they go out into the country and they find the yokels and the rubes out there in, in the countryside and uh, it, it gives a connotation that the people that grew up on, on the farms and going to the one room schoolhouses and they're, they're not backward and, and, and they're not uh, rubes and they're not yokels. Uh, they might not be as, as exciting as, as the uh, uh, action that happens on the uh, street of Toronto, but uh, th there's heritage and culture there and a large number of people in the county have that heritage, and it needs to be emphasized just as much as the uh, the neat stuff that happens in the cities. So uh, maybe when you're doing your production there, don't go out into the country and and and, and expect to find a bunch of yokels and rubes. <laughs> we're we're good people out there too, and I don't think that you do that. Thank, thank you, Councillor Chambers, uh, Councillor Kyle. Thanks, Mr. Rather. You and just to follow up with Councillor Chambers' comments, uh, I think too, especially if we talk about the rural areas, sometimes the heritage isn't as clearly evident. There might not be a heritage structure left on the farm, but that family has been there, virtually doing the same thing and progressing through the generations. So they might have a big modern new facility, but the heritage piece is still there. It just is not quite as evident as it would be if someone's got their old stone bank barn and, and sometimes it doesn't make sense to keep them up, but it really doesn't. So that doesn't mean the heritage piece isn't there. 
I might just add in, that really is that intangible cultural heritage piece. So those are those traditions. My background is actually industrial and agricultural heritage. So it's a love that I have myself. Um, and I do think we did hear that from the community too. And our engagement, I think that's why we can be really proud of this plan. It came directly from the community members. So um, yeah, those traditions are really important throughout the community. So I think that's something that we'll continue to be responsive to through this plan as we implement it. So that's a good, good question. Councillor Bell. Just a through you to uh, Kayla and Zach. Uh, this must be the cheapest strategy we've ever had. I I'm looking at the uh, action plan where it says cost. I see lots of ends, uh, which means no cost at all, which is wonderful. Um, can you explain how we actually make that work? I presume that means you are doing most of the work. That, that's my assumption. That's correct, yes. Yeah. So like I said, this is really the blueprint for my role. So we've never had an arts, culture, heritage strategy before. So it's our first one. Um, so it's really giving tasks behind what I'm doing really nice and clear and giving it over that 10 year period. So a lot of the things are just that resource sharing. Um, it's giving places for people to come together. Um, so it's not necessarily big monetary pieces. It's just providing that support so people know where they can perform, who they can perform with, and really connecting people. I think that's a really big piece at the center of the strategy is making sure people know what's here. It's not that we need to create something new, but it's really amplifying it and having those clear lists and those clear identifiers so people can get connected. So you, you've effectively written your job description. Sorry, what's that? You've effectively written your job description. I, yeah, I think it's a big, yeah, yeah. it is. It's a, it's a helpful <laughs> job description. Uh, it's good. I, yeah, I'm not no, knocking it. Yeah. It, it is it's good. But the, the um, other question I have, if I may, slightly different, action B13. Uh, you talk about a group called Grand Culture. Yeah. Um, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that. Yeah, so this was a question that came out um, before we even began on the strategy was to have an arts council. Um, so the Grand Culture group is fairly new and it has been developing over the last year or so. Um, and we decided rather than us start a new culture arts council, um, we would support one that's already establishing. So myself um, and my counterpart from Brantford sit on that as it's developing to really make sure that it bounces both needs of both communities. Um, and I'm really confident in the work that they're doing, that it's really growing strong and has a really good um, background with local artists connected to it. So they have just recently named themselves the Grand Culture. They had a vote um, and that's what was supported. So that is an arts council group that is developing. A little, if I may, um, are we confident that we are not going to um, conflict in any way with grand culture? I, I think it's a collaboration. I think that's really what the strategy points back to. It's that collaborating with the groups that are starting. So I don't think there's going to be any problems with them. It's working together. And I've actually been part of the group as it's developed. So I don't necessarily see a conflict with so I yeah. just say that because on, on, there is another uh, piece of our business where a group that is setting up um, to uh, help themselves are, are, are kind of trying to seize some control from what the county does. Okay. And yeah. I think we just need to be careful on that balance that, that you know, we mm -hmm. understand exactly what we control yeah. and what they control and, and we don't seed it without fully understanding it. Yeah, that's fair. And I think that's why I've been trying to attend the meetings as they develop too. So I'm there kind of from the beginning as it grows, but that is definitely something um, we'll keep our eye on. Yeah, thank you. Uh, are there any other questions? Councillor Miller. Yeah, uh, it sounds like you've got a bit of overlap into the report. So just a, a question of staff. Then. Um, so through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, they talk about um, under section objective B, um, one of the points noted, establish a set of uh, municipal funding criteria for museums that includes mandatory training and best practices for cultural institutions. So this was set as a medium term goal, four to six years out. I was actually hoping I'd read about it in tonight's report, I'll be honest with you. Because um, we have, you know, since amalgamation, it's, it's been, it's kind of organic the way I think they've um, been funded. We have the Paris Museum, the Dumfries Museum, we have the Burf Museum, which is in Harley, we have the Brant Museum, which is in Brant. So, and, and every year uh, we, we struggle um, 
at budget time, right? Because sometimes they'll make a grant or a community grant uh, program. And, you know, we debate, oh, so they want 7500 and we'll cut it in half or something like that. And, and I, I just, I feel like I don't like the way we do it. And it would be nice if we could treat them all equitably. So um, I guess the only thing I would say is, is I'd love to see that uh, particular objective uh, moved up. <clears throat> we do struggle with that. Yeah, and through the mayor, I think uh, – we're very uh, aware of that, and, and we actually want to get started this year and, and get out there and, you know, at least assess the temperature, if you will, and start to figure out what the needs are. So that is something we're very aware of and want, and want to start working towards this year, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we would all benefit from that. So, okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, uh, Emma, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, are there no other questions for Zach or Kayla? Seeing none, thank you very much. Um, Council, what are we going to do? Receive for information. Councillor Coleman, seconder is Councillor Oakley. All those in favor to receive? Okay, thank you. And then we're going to move right on to 10.1. Um, and if you can just stay there, Kayla. Um, we have a report in front of us. There's a copy of the report, uh, and there is a, mo a recommendation. Councillor Howes, you have the recommendation? Okay, you don't have the recommendation. Um, I'm looking for a recommendation then, please, to receive the report. Councillor Howes? I'm happy to make that recommendation. I and at the appropriate time, I have a couple procedural questions. Okay, let's get it on the floor first, seconded by Councillor Bell. Uh, now we can speak to it, Councillor House. Sorry, Mr. May, it says in here that we're approving rather than receiving. So just we, we received the presentation. And now we're on to 10 more. Now we're on to 10.1. So it's approving. Not, it's not approving. Just, yeah. I'm sorry, did I yeah. say? You said receiving. I just wanted all to be sure right, we're all approved. Yeah, we're approving it. Okay. Councillor House. So that was one of my questions. And, and, uh, <clears throat> My other question to staff is, this is a very wholesome uh, plan. Uh, there's a lot of great details. Um, we've heard around the table some little input elements, which, which are all uh, uh, fair and relevant. What I'm wondering is, it, if, we, if we approve this tonight, what's the... Where does the step one, step two, or, or sorry, option one, option two fit in in terms of when, like, short term, long term stuff with money, so, you know, do we do all 45 things? But can you speak to that a little bit, please? And, and I'm just trying to clarify what exactly you need approved tonight. Uh, through the mayor, I'll, I'll take a, a stab at that. I, I think uh, what what gets approved tonight is is that strategy. There, there is no monetary ask tonight. Um, I, I think it is our intent to come back to the budget process, you know, with a decision package to, uh, you know, explore some of those additional items that were identified. You, you kind of have option A and option B in front of you with the impl implementation plan. One is the status quo in terms of budget, and then option B is uh, additional resources. And the intent is to explore kind of uh, all opportunities, uh, such as grants or, or what have you, to kind of add those additional items. So. There's no budget being approved tonight, but it would just be really that uh, blueprint back to staff. Councillor House? Yeah, follow up uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So, okay, I, I think I understand that. And, and so, uh, if we vote to approve tonight, um, we're approving the plan and discussion about option one and option two. Op like, I guess option one is, is kind of by default. And then if we, uh, we will have a more thorough discussion about option two and the dollars that would be attached to it at a later time, probably related to budget. Uh, through the mayor, that, that is correct. Uh, you know, the intent is to come back to the budget process for those additional requests. Other questions? No? We're prepared to call a vote. It's on the floor. It's been second. All those in favor of receiving and approving uh, the report. Anybody opposed? 
Thank you. Thank you for your report. And we will move on to 5.5, which is Penny McVicker. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. I'm sorry? There was a 10.1.1 part of that agenda item that I think Zach is prepared to speak to. Oh, I'm sorry. Zach, go ahead. Uh, yeah, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, basically, uh, staff are suggesting that that recommendation be amended, that it come back as a staff report. Just it'll allow us some time to really flush this out on, you know, what are we looking for for the Heritage Conservation District? What are the parameters for those five designations? And then uh, kind of come back with uh, an understanding if it's possible to work within our existing work plans. And uh, I believe, you know, a Heritage Conservation District study is, is actually uh, a 2025 capital expense that's been identified. So we'll be able to kind of come back with a holistic uh, report on all these items for, for council. Councillor House. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and and uh, uh, as the two members of the Heritage Committee who are present tonight on, on Council, um, Councilor McAlpine and I had a discussion about this prior to the meeting, and and we were thinking in a very similar direction. We we were looking at uh, we basically before we could really vote on that recommendation from the Heritage Committee that Council really needs more information on what the staff resources will be, what the costs are associated with that. Um, so we were thinking def deferral, uh, but we would like to see a staff report that um, that would help inform that decision. Um, so I, I think, and I'm speaking for Councilor McAlpine too, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would like to speak to that too. Are there any other questions to that? Deferrals on the table? Seconded by Councilor McAlpine. Yeah, I, I think we before we start doing things like that too, we have to have professional people that are designating houses for special reasons. I don't know that staff is qualified to do heritage uh, districts and regions when we're not even finished building uh, our, our, you know, downtown St. George, downtown Burford, downtown anything. Um, so I, I don't know that we know where those districts will be and how big they should be because once you put a designation like that on a district, you're limiting the, what can happen in those areas, and it makes it very difficult for the people that own those properties to move on, uh, and it makes it difficult for the County of Brant to keep developing uh, and keep moving. So I don't think it's the right time anyway, so I'm glad you've deferred it. Maybe we're, I'm glad for different reasons than you are, but I, I think that there needs to be more qualified people on making those decisions uh, than just someone that says it's an old house and it fits in the parameters of our heritage uh, numbers, I think it needs to have something a little bit more special than just an age to qualify it in a heritage district. That's only my thinking. Um, but I do know that it changes lives and it does change the ability for that property to, to survive and to move on and to flourish. Councillor House? Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And yeah, we may be looking at it from two different perspectives. Um, but I, I, uh, I do believe that the intentions that were coming from the Heritage Advisory Committee are aligned with what we're seeing in the arts, culture, and heritage master plan. I reviewed the terms of reference today for the Heritage Advisory Committee, and, and I, I think it's also consistent with, with our intentions. There are plenty of properties within the County of Brant that need to be considered for designation that are not residential or, you know, the, the, some of them we own. <laughs> right, so, so the, I think that's great discussion for the future, and that's part of why we have a heritage advisory committee. Absolutely, and I do sit on that with you. Uh, you, you miscounted there. There's three of us here. Yes, there are. Yeah, uh, no, and, and as I said, it's different from a heritage property and a heritage district. Once you say a district is a district, all you have to do is go to St. Jacobs to find out what troubles they had in St. Jacobs when they declared it a heritage district. People that live three streets over couldn't sell their house. So there, there are problems that, that come up when you start designated districts. So I think it's good that you've tabled it. It's on the floor. Are there any other comments? And the clerk has something to say. Through, through your worship, just to clarify to Councillor House, uh, yourself and Councillor McAlpine moved the recommendation onto the floor and then also moved a motion to refer it to staff. Thank you, through the mayor. Uh, correct, uh, no decision tonight. Um, still to be considered, 
at another point in the future with the benefit of the staff report. Thank you. Okay. We can move forward from that. Okay, so now we're going to go to Penny McPicker. I'm sorry, we have to vote. I didn't think we had to vote. To refer. Okay, we need to vote to refer. All those in favor? Thank you. Poor Penny. Penny McVicker. Um, we're going to um, lose the feed, if we could, uh, Gary, uh, for this presentation. And let me know when we're not recording.
the next item on the agenda is 5.6. If you want to come up and give us your name and uh, who you represent, please. You have 10 minutes to speak to us, and then we'll have questions. Uh, hello, Council. My name is Michaela Cargus, and I'm here representing uh, Nova Vida. I sit on the board of directors there, and I am joined here by Safi. Yes, my name is Safi Hafizada. I'm also a board member of Nova Vida, also a constituent of Brant County. So I came to speak to you today to urge you to vote in favor of a motion to commit immediate emergency funding to intimate partner and gender-based violence support services. I work in the education sector, and I have seen firsthand the impact of intimate partner and gender-based violence in my work. I serve on my provincial, uh, my union's provincial committee for the status of women, and I sit on the board of directors for Nova Vida. Despite all my training, advocacy, and workshops, intimate partner and gender-based violence continues. It continues because these issues don't care that I took a workshop, but it will matter if you direct funding. This violence thrives in our community because of a lack of funding. Nova Vida works to end interpersonal violence and abuse by supporting individuals and families who have experienced domestic violence, intimate partner violence, and gender-based violence through the provision of crisis intervention, emergency shelter, transitional support, children's programs, and counseling, and by fostering accountability for those who harm through intervention, counseling, public education, and systemic advocacy. None of these services happen in a vacuum. In fact, these services rely on provincial funding, government grants, and charitable donations. This vital sector is overwhelmingly underfunded, with very little reliable and steady funding that can inform future planning, innovation, and respond to increased demand for these services. In fact, frontline shelter workers are left in low-paying positions and their time is dedicated to fundraising to keep the lights on and services flowing. Services we rely on being there when there is a need. These are essential services. In 2023, the emergency COVID funding from the federal government was terminated. While the emergency funding was cut, the impact of the pandemic at the shelter and in our community continued to be felt deeply. This loss meant that shelter staff were reduced and programs that reached out to diverse communities and Brant County were cut or cancelled. This means that your constituents facing intimate partner and gender-based violence have less options for supports, for accessing shelter and transitional housing, planning for safety, and accessing counselling. We can't rely on a golf tournament to ensure the safety is available in our county. I am a resident of Paris and these are my neighbours. What would a rural transitional outreach support worker mean to our community? This would mean that women and children facing violence in Brant County would have access to the services of Nova Vida here in the county. This would mean that transportation and geography wouldn't become a barrier to safety. This would mean that plans for housing, counseling, family supports could be accessed close to home, removing barriers for ensuring safety. As Brant County continues to grow, this service becomes more and more essential. It was not long ago that this council voted in favor of declaring intimate partner and gender-based violence an epidemic in our county. This vote wasn't a political stance. There's data that shows this issue has reached epidemic levels. Police responses to domestic violence, crisis calls to the shelter, the need for affordable housing solutions to escape violence are all on the rise. This is an epidemic. This is a crisis. We can meet this moment with help. When these services remain underfunded, the consequences that are that growth cannot meet the demand and that people remain in violent situations, exposing children to further violence and denying victims and abusers the support that they need. It means that frontline workers cannot be compensated with salary and benefits comparable to their private sector colleagues and they are left financially disadvantaged. It means that the decision to remain on the front line of this emotional work pulls at your heart. You're doing it for others while being held down by a system. It is no secret that many of the workers in this sector identify as women. This is when underfunding becomes part of the system that perpetuates gender-based violence. 
Today you have a step in front of you that you can take. Today you can choose to take action to end the epidemic you unanimously declared you recognized. This is just the first step, but every start, every journey starts with one step. To vote against this mo motion provides oxygen to this epidemic. I encourage you to support the motion. I encourage you to take a step to end the crisis. Thank you, and I'll simply add a few other areas uh, to Michaela's conversation. So as an individual uh, and as community leaders, we have a role to play. Um, so I want to first again recognize and uh, thank you for uh, commending your leadership in recognizing the epidemic as a gender-based violence in our community. I've also had the privilege of being a board member at Nova Vita for almost a decade. And I've seen firsthand the incredible work that's done there. What sets the strategy at Nova Vita apart from other organizations is their end-to-end -end approach. They do not limit their work to treating just the outcome of gender-based violence, but work tirelessly and passionately to get at the roots of the issue. They engage with partners, organi partner organizations to work with the victim and perpetrator, and they, eradic and they educate at the school to inform before it becomes an issue. In my career, and as a police auxiliary and as a reservist, I've met many individuals who have displayed great acts of courage. But it is a unique level of courage that is displayed by a mother who leaves the safety of her home to the insecurity of an unknown institution for the well-being of her family. As individuals and as community leaders, do we have the same courage to do everything in our power to support them? We can all agree that we are entering in uncertain economic times. Ample research shows that these times also create the material conditions that increase gender-based violence. Often gender-based violence can be positioned as an urban city issue and not a visible prevalence in urban and rural settings. Where you are located does have an impact. That impact uh, was uh, researched by Western University. They looked at l rural communities and found rural communities are smaller and it is harder for women in these communities get, to get out of their relationships or the stigma around their relationships because there are fewer community members and people know each other's business more. Your role in this Frank County is more Im important and impactful than you may recognize. I'll end my conversation with a call to action. I encourage you to understand how important your role is on the communities in the County of Brant. Show that you have the courage to support the needs of your constituents and take a leadership role in driving down incidences of gender-based violence by ensuring those on the front lines have the resources to be successful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Are there any questions to the delegation? Councilor Kyle, you're first. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. I have a couple, if that's, that's all right. Yep. Um, my first question is um, to the delegation through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Nova Vida, is that the only women's shelter that is available to our residents in the county and I guess city of Brantford because it is located in the city or are there other ones in the area that we know of? Yeah, so Nova Vida is the only uh, women's services in Brantford and Brant County. Uh, the next adjacent would be Haldeman Norfolk Women's Services. Okay, and can you remind us, I, I'm trying to remember back to the fall, but do you happen to know how many times Nova Vida had to turn away help for folks that were trying to... Um, we may have to look that up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, we, we know that the services cannot be expanded under the current funding um, that we have, and actually it's been cut. Um, we know that uh, we've had to reduce uh, shelter, frontline shelter workers, so there's only one shelter worker on in the evenings and on weekends, and that also we've had to, there's been a serious reduction in the hours provided to women in the county and our rural communities. And then my, my last question, if I may, Mr. Mayor, um, the 
rural outreach worker that's proposed with the funding request um, that we'll look at later. Um, how do you see that role uh, materializing in the county? What types of things would that person be doing? Uh, well, at this point, we're defining the role, but I would say it would be similar to what Nova Vida's teams do today. So we have some level of outreach that happens in Paris today at the, uh, the medical center that's here. Uh, it allows individuals to come to a location where they can uh, meet with a counselor. They can understand what services are available to them. They can then engage in a... Um, an action if required to remove them from where they are if there's sufficient action required. Uh, engage with other partner organizations that can facilitate the choices that they're making. So it would serve as that secondary person or liaison to allow individuals access. And as I said, the research shows that rural communities have the least ability to access individuals who can educate, inform, and support them. So that's the main purpose, I think, of that individual. Councillor Miller. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through to the board members, how is Nova Vida funded now? So there's a, actually, Safi, you can answer this really well. There is a variety of um, provincial funding, um, government grants, and I'm going to add just a comment on grant writing. Um, grant writing is almost an endless treadmill of work that doesn't always pan out. Uh, you, you write grant for this, you write a grant for that, and you, you might get a, a couple of them. It's a little bit of, you know, you throw a lot of stuff up against the wall and some of it will stick. Um, that takes up a lot of time and effort. It's a, it's a valuable waste of time for an uh, executive director to be working on that when we can't move forward on a strategic plan, when we can't move projects and innovative um, ideas forward, and we can't expand the services to um, to our constituents and to the people that, that actually need that service. But Safi does a lot with our books, so you can talk a bit about the funding. So my role is uh, as treasurer. So what we have is you have the ministry providing a portion of the funding you have. Uh, so Nova Vida is not strictly just a woman shelter, so just keeping that in mind, the programs that they have are uh, diverse. They move from a core program of uh, women's shelter to support for victims, support for perpetrators and children, as well as homeless. So the beds that they have are funded to a certain degree for homelessness from the city. They have funding from the government of Ontario for a portion of their work with an expectation that they, remain, they raise significant funds on their own uh, to ensure that they can make operational um, budgets. So uh, there is government funding, but a lot of work is done to raise their own funds uh, to ensure that they have the sufficient uh, amounts. I mean, if you're looking for specific details, I can get them for you. Um, but we do work with three layers. It's provincial, federal, uh, and municipal governments, and predominantly it's provincial. Yeah, the reason, it's, sorry, Mr. Mayor, through, uh, the reason I'm asking, uh, yes. we, we're very limited in our ability to raise revenues um, because it's just property taxes. Um, so I, I, I'm going to ask, I hope you did, I assume you did, but I will ask, have you made uh, presentations to the local MP, the local MPP? Yeah. So we're continuing to work on our presentations to the MPP, who we know sits in a majority government for, uh, situation. The budget was out today. I haven't had a chance to do a deep dive on this topic specifically. Um, we are working to build our connections and our network uh, with the city of Brantford. Um, what I will put to you, and, and just something to ponder, um, what is the cost of not, of not doing this and of not having that funding? Um, I think similar to, and. Uh, we want our essential services, our frontline ex uh, front services, uh, to be available for our members that need them for, for safety and for health. Um, this is one of those. And in the absence of, of the shelter being available, in the absence of the services provided being available, and you know, Safi pointed out, the provincial funding actually is, um, it, it is actually purposefully underfunded. Um, with the expectation that uh, charity and fundraising will fill that gap. This is uh, something that keeps women and children in our community safe from violence. And, and we are relying on, 
on dinners and, and on golf tournaments, the Mayor's Gala is coming. You may know that um, that it will um, benefit Nova Vida. But this service, without it, um, leaves many, many victims quite vulnerable. And, uh, and the surrounding area has one of the highest call rates, police responses to domestic violence in our country. Any other questions? No. Seeing no other questions, thank you for your presentation. Thank you, uh, Council. Motion to receive, Councilor Oakley, Councilor Kyle. All those in favor received his information. Thank you. Um, when we were approving the agenda, we decided we would go to 12.2 uh, right away, and that is a proposed resolution. Uh, Councilor Oakley, you have that. Thank you very much. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Bell. Whereas the County of Brant in November 2023 declared gender-based violence and inter intimate partner violence an epidemic and requested related community services to submit funding requests. And whereas through discussion with the community services, Willow Bridge, SAC Brant, Victim Services Brant, and Nova Vida expressed their, they are over capacity to the point where non-budget in-kind services offered by the County of Brant could not be utilized. And where regular funding for these services has been deferred to the Joint City-County Services Committee uh, for further discussion as it relates to the 2025 budget and beyond. However, there is acute funding needed as an interim measure. And whereas while acknowledging an epidemic is a first step, meaningful action must be made in the immediate term by the County Brant to uphold the resolution passed by Council on November 28th, 2023. Then it is directed that the County Brant utilizes reserve and search plus funding to fund the following funding requests. Uh, Sexual Assault Center of Brant funding request one, 24-hour crisis and support line worker, $35,000. Sexual Assault Center of Brant funding request two, part-time counselor dedicated to it, adult county of Brant residents who are survivors of sexual violence, at risk of sexual violence, or who are a part parent, partner, or other intimate support for a survivor, $25,025. Sexual Assault Center of Brant funding request three, counselor dedicated to county of Brant youth who are survivors of sexual violence, at risk of sexual violence, or who are a parent, partner, or other intimate support for a survivor, $30,165. Victim services of Brant funding request, the continuation of a victim services staff to work from the Brant detachment, where they can directly connect and imme provide immediate support to people who have reported gender-based violence and intimate partner violence, $35,573. Willowbridge Community Services funding request, 0 0.6 FTE therapist for counseling services, 0 0.2 FTE for women, children, and men affected by gender-based violence, and 0 0.4 FTE for individual, couple, and family psychotherapy for the same populations, $60,415. Nova Vida funding request, staff position for a dedicated transitional outreach support officer, support worker to address the intimate partner violence and gender-based violence epidemic in the County of Brant, $80,000 for a total one-time allotment of $266,177 to be funded from reserve and surplus funds. Thank you. Questions? Councillor Howes. Uh, thank, <clears throat> excuse me. thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm, uh, I'm supportive of, of what Councillor Oakley is trying to achieve here. Uh, at the same time, I <clears throat> $266,000 uh, is a lot of money. And I'd just like some clarification from staff, if that's possible, if that um, the, the intent is for these funds to come from reserve and surplus funds. And I would feel more comfortable supporting this if I had an idea that those funds are available within those two piggy banks. Um, Heather? Thank you, through the mayor. Um, we will be bringing forward in the next couple of months the year-end surplus report. Um, we do believe that there will be sufficient funds if this is what council wishes to do with those. Um, in terms of reserves, the only reserve we would be taking from or we would recommend would be contingency and surplus and contingency, they feed off each other. So um, approving this, we would, we would put forward in our surplus report that this is the first place that any surplus funds would be directed. It just, it will impact the amount of um, contingency at the end of the year. 
we need to draw upon because that budget time we didn't take specifically from reserves and from um, and from surplus we just took the 1.5 million so wherever we need to draw at the end of the year is what we'll need to draw but if this is council's direction to fund this then that's where staff would recommend that it come out at the uh, year-end surplus report we'll address it thank you councillor house uh, thank you mr chair just so what i heard within that answer was uh, we anticipate the funds will be available um, and I understand a, re a more detailed report will be forthcoming but I believe there's a time sensitive nature to this decision so um, I, I will be supporting this this resolution any other co any other comments council chambers just another comment just a, a couple uh, questions of clarification if I might so I understand what's being proposed yep. the uh, <clears throat> The funding is to be uh, taken from the uh, contingency reserve and the surplus funds, uh, and, and we're not sure exactly what the surplus funds will be because the report is forthcoming. Is this the same fund that we uh, took, uh, I think it was one and a half million dollars from, uh, to lower the tax levy? Is that what, where this is anticipated coming from? Through the mayor, yes, this is the same pot of money that that 1.5 million came from. There was a lot of debate on when this was considered the first time, uh, when it was considered at budget time in context with the priorities of all the other funding pressures that we have. There was a lot of discussion on whether it was advisable or not to take money from the contingency surplus reserve fund, and uh, many councillors spoke very eloquently about the reason not to do that. And I remember we, uh, the original staff recommendation was, I think uh, the question was asked, uh, staff responded that uh, they would recommend a million dollars be taken from that. And the council decided to take, I think it was one and a half million, a half a million dollars more than what staff was recommending at that time. Uh, am, I, am I correct on that? Does, does that ring a bell, Heather? Yeah, through you, Councillor Chambers. Yeah, we were looking at about a million from both the surplus and the reserve that we were recommending. Um, Council did choose to go higher than that. Um, where it plays out is that in 2025, there may be that much less room to make any moves in the 2025 budget because depending on how this makes us draw out more out of that reserve. And, and, and again, the, the questions I'm asking it. Please don't interpret that as not supporting the need for funding of these organizations. In, in my mind, it is a matter of how to fund uh, the, the requests. So I don't want to be accused of not supporting the, uh, the organizations and, and the good work that they do. But I, I do recall many counselors spoke very, very eloquently about not doing what is proposed here. And I'll let them speak to that. The other uh, issue, uh, the other clarification I want to have is the request, are they exactly the same as what was re what we discussed at budget or have there been changes in, in, in the, the numbers? I believe they're the same, but Councillor Oak, can you, they are the same? Uh, yes, they are the same. So we have considered this once already uh, in context of the overall budget. And council decided not to fund these uh, requests. Am I correct on that? We'll take it to the clerk first and then back to Councillor Oakley. Through your worship to Councillor Chambers, the Committee of the Whole decided not to move forward with recommendations to council. The only decision that council made on this was originally forwarding the funding request to budget. At the end of budget, the decision was made to send it to social services. We have heard back from social services that that's not the correct venue. Um, so, in my opinion, no reconsideration is required because that was committee of the whole. Well, I, I'm not getting. I'm not going to get into the procedural reconsideration. The, the, the topic's too important for that. So that's not what it was getting at. Um, so we'll, we'll have that argument uh, tomorrow, uh, whether it should be or shouldn't be. But I'm not going to do it tonight. Um, the other uh, uh, issue that was discussed at the time 
when this was discussed originally was that um, the question was asked, we should consider whether we want to continue doing this or not. Because if you uh, hire the people and then the funding is not continued, then you're in the position uh, as one of these organizations is where a service that is being provided ends up being taken away. And I see at the bottom of, of the, uh, the the resolution, it, it's very specific. It says for a total one-time allotment. So are you contemplating that this is just for one year? They're going to hire people for one year and then they're on their own? Is that what, what this recommendation is saying? Uh, Councillor Oakley? Uh, through the mayor to uh, Councillor Chambers to so to, to answer that that question there, um, yes, the idea is that it is a one-time allotment with the I with the idea being that later on we have a report discussing the joint city council joint city council hold on joint city county uh, committee of services um, to direct that in that direction so we have a permanent uh, longer term solution. And, and, and discuss what our long-term solution would, would be for that. Um, in regards to these organizations and them hiring for one year and, and not knowing the future of it, um, it is my understanding from, from many of these organizations, as they sort of alluded to, they operate on grant funding. Their entire organization often works on a year-by-year -year basis because they apply for a grant one year, they may get it, they may not the following year. So. Is it less than ideal that we would provide this one time and they don't know whether or not they're going to get it again because depending on how that conversation may go at Joint City Council, City County Services, uh, we may not continue. Yes, that's less than ideal. But it is the norm they're used to working with and for now it is an increased service while we deal with a longer term solution through that uh, mechanism. Just, just that, uh, if, if I might, Mr. Mayor, I think this is important. Uh, speaking to the Joint City County Services Committee, it's my understanding that all of these requests are for county services and county services alone. In other words, there are no, none of the $266,177 are going to these organizations to fund things in the city or for the city residents. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that is correct. So having said that, if, if are, are you suggesting that the through the city county committee that the county ask the city to help fund a county uh, cost? And how do you think that's going to play? Councillor Oakley? Through, through the mayor to, to Councillor Chambers. Uh, yes. No, I, I wouldn't expect the city to just jump in and say we'll take you know, what's our usual split, 70-30 on these positions that specifically deal with the county. Um, however, the, so these requests were submitted to us in the, in the context of the county is going to fund them, the county is going to carry this through. In that conversation, we're going to have a strategic, um, we will hopefully have strategic direction for 2025 to come back to these services uh, if we choose to continue to fund them with something that has a holistic approach between uh, the county and the city. And many of these, I mean, many of these roles um, while we're directed towards being uh, county specific, um, you know, many of them can be immediately uh, redirected to serving both communities like the crisis and support line worker, um, part-time counselors, counselors, all these things can be redirected. And um, once we have a, a strategic look at it, we'll be able to work with these organizations to be able to fulfill some of the needs that we're getting directly to the county here, also deal with the city. We can have a conversation on whether or not we want to spend all this money there, so on and so forth. We'll be able to have that strategic conversation. The, the, the fact is, though, that these the $266,000 that are being asked for from county taxpayers are for county services. And I don't think that you'll be very successful in asking the city to pay, to contribute to sharing the cost of services that are provided in the county. So the avenue of going through the city, county, joint services committee 
it's, it's the county's position that uh, we don't fund city and they don't fund that. So we're going to be arguing against ourselves. So I don't have a lot of faith in the fact that through that avenue, we're going to have offsetting funds. The point I'm getting at is if you want the services that are being provided through this to continue, the county is going to have to continue to fund that. The city's not going to fund something that the county has for the sole benefit of the county. It won't happen. Just as we won't do that to them. So if that's the case, then I, I'd be very, very hesitant in providing a service and having the various employees have caseloads and then having the funding withdrawn from them much like the uh, one funding request is for a service to be continued. If they don't get it, then that service is ended. The clients that they're serving and the caseload they have uh, in some of these may be, uh, it, it won't be good. Uh, putting all that into context with the discussion that we had with these priorities, uh, these requests in terms of priorities of our overall budget, which was 8.7% increase, and the reluctance of many councillors to dip into the reserve uh, surplus funds uh, to the extent that we already have, uh, I, I don't think that from a funding perspective, that an additional $266,000 coming from county taxpayers at this time is uh, something that I can support. And that's not to say that I don't support the, uh, the request. I just don't see how we can fund that knowing that our tax situation is what it is. Having heard Heather uh, speak that a report on surpluses is forthcoming, uh, and the crystal ball says there may be money available then, perhaps we can defer this until that time where we can see uh, where the funds uh, may come from. Councillor Bell and then Councillor Kyle. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, this is a subject I think we have failed on uh, a few times already. Um, we loudly supported the move to declare uh, an emergency situation. We made it clear that we would be there to support, and when the time came to support, we didn't support. And I feel that that's a huge embarrassment to us as a council. I think it fails to recognize the social challenges that we face in our county, and actually the same social challenges the city face. So it's not as if we're on our own here. We are doing our bit, and the city will have to do its bit. This is a stopgap measure. I think we need to use the rest of this year to really work hard to try and find a sustainable funding solution. I don't know what that is yet, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't give funding this year to people that are in great need. And sadly, if we can't find a solution at the end of the year and we can't continue funding, well, at least we've helped people in 2024. And I, I b believe that that's something that we should, should absolutely do. And if we have spare funding, if we have surplus funding, I think I can't think of a better way to, to direct it at this point in time. I fully support this motion. Councillor Kyle. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Through you, um, picking up on some of Councillor Bell's comments, I think um, there's a couple things at play here. Um, one, we did, we did have lots of discussions about this back at budget time, but I think what's different now is that we've been presented with new information, and that's that the in-kind contributions that we were willing to make at that time, um, the organizations are not able to use because they're that over capacity and that overextended. Um, and the other thing being, we've heard back at a first, the first response back from social services was, was that this wasn't in the mandate. So now we have to um, take the time to figure out what the avenue is to get that um, into the, onto the table for discussion and perhaps Councillor Chambers is not wrong in that the city maybe doesn't want to partner but that doesn't mean we can't look for other partners to support uh, this with us. Um, 
we have good partnerships with Six Nations, for example, or other municipalities around us. Um, so I see this as something that is quite literally a stopgap that buys us time to find that more sustainable funding source. Um, I think the other thing that's important to highlight, um, and I couldn't possibly do a better job myself than the folks who were before us tonight to speak, both the, the delegation uh, with Penny, um, as well as the, the folks from Nova Vida, in that um, they are chronically underfunded um, by all levels, and uh, they need the help in order to continue to provide these important services. Um, I have family members who've had to make use of services, not in the county, but in their municipalities, so um, I can relate with how important those services are. I also recognize that um, one person's experience is going to differ very, or very different, um, differently to the next person. Um, so a service that works really well for one person is maybe not going to work for another person and their experience is not so good. But continuing to not fund those services also doesn't provide those organizations with the breathing room to be able to improve those services so that perhaps the next time there's less folks who maybe can't access. Um, if I remember correctly, the number was quite, quite high. I want to say it was in the 300 range for people they had to turn away uh, from Nova Vida, for example, last year. That's a lot of people that they had to turn away who needed help um, at a very critical juncture in their life. Um, so I would prefer to see, like Councillor Bell said, if we have some surplus funding, I can't think of a better way. Uh, quite frankly, if we save one person's life, uh, $266,000 is really nothing. Uh, we are a rural community that happens to be situated next to the most populous First Nations community in the country. Um, the two most at-risk groups are rural women and Indigenous women. So that is incredibly relevant to our community here. Um, so I will be supporting this tonight. Any other comments before we call the vote? Councillor Miller? Just uh, a couple of things. Um, yeah, we just passed an 8.7% budget increase for this year. I think we all know that. We're still not funding our infrastructure. We have a, a bridge down in Ward 4. We have a bridge down in Ward 5. We have a road not open in Ward 5. We're not doing what the property taxes are for. And, and Nova Vida doing a good job. Um, there's a need there. Got it. Understand it. There's a, a lineup we could have going out the door of, of other, I think, worthwhile needs. Um, we just don't have the funds for uh, a new hospital, affordable housing food banks i guess they're overwhelmed um it was mentioned tonight legal aid they don't have enough funding there's all these things it's not going to get any better the interest on the federal debt's going up 36 percent this year it's not getting better um but at the same time i think we need <laughs> we really do need to um, focus on what we're supposed to be doing with the taxpayer dollars from property taxes um I guess this is how you keep raising property taxes over and over again by never saying no. The other thing is the two hundred sixty-six thousand. That is a that is a big chunk of change for something that we do not have oversight. We give money to Long Point. We have oversight. We give money to Grand River uh, Conservation Authority. We have oversight. Uh, police. We have oversight. Library. We have oversight. We don't have any oversight on the monies going here. I don't think we need to do it this year. I'm sure there's a demand. I would rather we leave it with staff, get some more information, put a plan together. I The, the one-offs are the worst. They're just the worst. They hire somebody and the next year the funds aren't there. Let's take our time. We're already into March. We've approved the budget. Um, at, at the very least, we should defer it until we know at least what our, um, our surplus or could, could possibly be. So I'm not in favor of this paying out this money uh, today, tonight. Councillor Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and um, oh, I would love to support a lot more, but I just don't know how we can do it. And I think that anybody that other than Councillor Miller who wasn't at that meeting last night and the one we had a week ago in Burford should have heard the taxpayers loud and clear. They've had enough at 8.7%. And I don't think we can afford any more on this right now. So I will not be supporting it. Not, I would love to, and I would love to see it deferred, as Councillor Miller said, to see, see what we do have coming back. 
in the in the in the, in the reserves. So. Councilor McAlpine. These are the kinds of things that pull at your heartstrings, and it's really hard to make these decisions. And um, unfortunately, it's again a case of being downloaded from the federal and the provincial governments, and uh, where they should be supported. Um, and I think we do spend a lot on our social services already, and we need to figure out how that we can support these things. And I think at the very least, we have to wait till we determine our budget surplus, whether we do have the money. So I can't support this, unfortunately. And, and it's hard for me to, to do that. So. Any more comments? Councillor Chambers, are you looking to put your hand up? Just uh, a, a co an overall comment with the uh, funding of, of social programming. Uh, we've heard uh, and we see that there are needs in, in this area. Uh, there are, are needs, Councilor Miller mentioned a few. I, I you know, I'm not going to get into personal testimonials, but uh, mental health issues are, are something that is, is, is very crippling to a, a lot of families in, in not only the urban areas, but, but the uh, uh, rural areas. There, there, there's uh, people that we don't even know about that are, are in need of uh, what I'll call social services, the, the social net. The, the way the social net is, is funded is, is crazy. Uh, in that some of the things that mean the most to, to, to people are argued in venues such as this, and, and we, we all feel bad about not being able to support that, and, and we look perhaps bad in not supporting uh, requests, but we can't uh, agree with everything. And uh, it's always nice to look at things in terms of priorities, uh, Councilor Kyle suggested that she can't think of anything better to uh, spend a surplus on, but if, if something happens, uh, and the reason that the working capital, we used to call it, is kept at a million bucks uh, or, or more, things can happen in, that, that are totally unexpected. The city of Hamilton is going through a, a horrible situation where their uh, whole computer system is compromised by a, uh, a ransom uh, attack and it's costing them millions of dollars to get that put back together and they still haven't done that. If something like that happens, that's what the contingencies are for. As was said many times at the uh, budget sessions where I suggested that we take an, an additional half a million dollars and, and where, are the, where, where are those voices now? They're, they're, they're saying that, well, well, let's just take another quarter million dollars that we don't even know whether we have or not and do that. So municipal funding is a, a terrible thing <laughs> when, when we look at social programming and, and feel bad that we can't fund that. But you, you have to be prepared to understand what the property taxes are for and what the provincial uh, federal social net for the province and the areas in the province are for. We need to lobby the province for funding and we can't just keep uh, shoring up provincial uh, uh, shortfalls by the property tax because we don't have uh, we don't have a lot of ways to, to raise money and, and an 8.7 uh, percent tax increase is not there's a lot of unhappy people out there a lot of people uh, can't afford that and we keep adding to that and we keep adding to the base budget uh, and, and just I'll end by saying I would like the uh, provisions to be separated and voted on separately if that comes, but I'll move that the issue be deferred until the report that Heather mentioned is presented to council. Councillor Kyle. Thanks, Mr. Mayor, through you. Um, I agree that the municipal taxes, the property taxes shouldn't have to pay for that, but the reality is that um, it has been downloaded to us 
and we have people in our community, our residents, who require these services, and they're services that we're otherwise able, unable to provide ourselves as a municipality, so we need to learn, lean on the um, partners, community partners, like the folks in the room tonight, um, who can provide those services on our behalf for the residents. So I, I do 100% agree, and, and I think that um, if we if we do uh, if we are successful in in um, providing the funding tonight, that we do have to make that a part of our advocacy as far as government relation goes, because um, we do need to be advocating to both the province and the the federal level that this is something that needs some attention. Uh, we've declared it an epidemic, and that was one of the actions that was included as part of that declaration. So, um, absolutely, we do need to we do need to go that avenue as well and put pressure on the province and on the federal government to step up and to fill those gaps where there are gaps, so that we don't have to be putting that on the property tax. But I do see this as um, an emergency uh, request that we can and should fill in order to make sure those services are provided to our residents and in their time of need while we work on some of those other avenues such as sustainable funding as well as the uh, political advocacy to try and put the pressure on the other levels of government. Councillor Miller. I just, I just want to point out, um, yeah, there, there's cutbacks from the feds from the province we're going to see that more and more around the table. And just as an example, next month there will be a report from social services. Um, there was a program that funded, from the feds, that funded two outreach workers for homeless encampments. Apparently it's, it, they're, they're doing a great job. That federal money is going to dry up. So the request from social services is for the city and the county to pick up those two extra people. All I'm saying is, it's just going to continue. We will not see this decrease. So um, <laughs> we're going to see a lot more, um, very, very, um, I would say, um, a lot more good requests come forward. And uh, like I say, right now we're not funding what we should be funding. Anyone else have anything to say? Councillor Coleman? Correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Mayor, I did. Council Chambers make an aspirate of real motion. Did you move that? I'll second it. Get it on the floor then. Doesn't this have to fail first? Does Council Chambers have a seconder? Councilor Coleman? Madam Clerk? Uh, through your worship. Um, Yes, no, the motion to defer or to refer would take precedence to any motion um, to separate out the clauses and to vote on the main motion. Councilor Chambers? I'll be very specific in my wording. I'll use the word table until such time as a report from staff. Refer and defer can get kind of sloppy, so it's actually a table in motion. Do you, you find that less sloppy, Councilor Coleman, for your second? Okay. Any other comments before we call the vote? The vote is to table it. All those in favor? Opposed? It's defeated. So we're back to the original motion. Councilor Chambers? And uh, I would like the uh, provisions to be... Uh, separately. In other words, I support one, but I don't support them all. Okay. I'm going to let the clerk handle that. Through, through your worship, just point of clarity, so only the action clauses, not the whereas clauses? Or all of them? The provisions as they're listed uh, at, as the bullet points on the, uh, on the agenda. For example, one sexual assault center of Brant funding request, 35,000. Number two, sexual assault center of Brant funding request, number two. Number three, sexual assault. All right, through your worship, Councillor Oakley has requested a recorded vote um, on this motion. Therefore, I'm going to ask everybody who is in favor of the following clause to stand. 
sexual, um, the county of Grant utilizes reserve and surplus funds to fund the following funding requests. So the first one, sexual assault center of Grant funding request number one, 24 hour crisis and support line worker 35,000. Those in favor, please stand. Thank you, you may sit. Those opposed, please stand. The motion passes five to four. The second clause that the County of Rant utilizes reserve and surplus funding our surplus funds to fund the following funding request, sexual assault center of grant funding request number two, part-time counselor dedicated to adult county of grant residents who are survivors of sexual violence at risk of sexual violence or who are a parent, partner, or other intimate support for a survivor, $25,000, $25. Those in favor, please stand. Thank you. You may sit. Those opposed, please stand. The motion carries five to four. Okay, request number three, the Sexual Assault Center of Grant funding request number three, counselor dedicated to County of Grant youth who are survivors of sexual violence, at risk of sexual violence or who are a parent, partner, or other intimate support for a survivor, $30,165. Those in favor, please stand. Thank you. You may sit. Those opposed, please stand. The motion carries five to four. Victim Services of Grant funding request, the continuation of a victim services staff to work from the Grant detachment where they can directly connect and provide immediate support to people who have reported gender-based violence and intimate partner violence, $35,573. Those in favor, please stand. Uh, Councilor Chambers has his hand up. Yeah, j just a, a clarification. This is the position that is already in place that will cease if the funding isn't continued. Am I correct on that? I believe so. And that's the only one of, of that nature. So if, if it's not supported, then a service that is being provided will be taken away. Yeah, we'll end. Could those in favor please stand? The motion carries unanimously. Next, Willow Bridge Community Services funding request, point six, FPE, FTE therapist for counseling services, point two, FTE for women, children, and men affected by gender-based violence, and point four, FTE for individual, couple, and family psychotherapy for the same population, $60,415. Those in favor, please stand. Thank you, you may be seated. Those opposed, please stand. The motion carries five to four. Nova Vita funding request, staff position for a dedicated outreach for a dedicated transitional outreach support worker to address the intimate partner violence and gender-based violence epidemic in the county of Grant, $80,000. Those in favor, please stand. Thank you. You may be seated. Those opposed, please stand. Thank you. The motion carries five to four. Uh, and finally, for a one-time allotment of $266,177 to be funded from reserves and surplus funds, those in favor, please stand. Thank you, you may be seated. Those opposed, please stand.
Motion carries five to four. Well, it was a long way to the end there, but uh, I, I think Councilor Chambers was right. I, mean, I'm, I didn't get a chance to speak before we voted, but uh, the last couple of public meetings that we had, uh, taxpayers are furious with us. Uh, last night was ridiculously, um, the comments were very mean-spirited and uh, a lot of untruths were, were said last night uh, at Canesville. People speaking things they didn't know very much about. And in Burford, it got kind of hostile too, and people are not happy with us with our budget. Um, but I think that that's our own fault. I think, I think when we go, think back as to how we did the budget, I think that if we had have done things knowing that this was, I think we gave money away uh, to people that certainly didn't deserve it as, as much, I think, in my eyes, my opinion, as the people that came here tonight. I think of sports teams and clubs and things that, things that have been supported through the lifetime of this county since 2000, um, and it's almost like it's expected. And we, we raise our hands for expected money too easily, and with money like this, it's like pulling teeth. And as the mayor, I'm very embarrassed of the way that it all folded out. It's only my opinion. Uh, I'm glad we got where we got to today. I'm going to take a 10-minute recess.
Okay, Gary, whenever you're ready. Okay, I think we're ready to carry on. I believe we're at 6.1, which is the adoption of the minutes from the previous meeting. Uh, Councilor Oakley. Uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councilor Miller that the County of Brant Council minutes of February 27th and March 12th, 2024 be approved. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried? Uh, business arising from the minutes? Are there any? Seeing none, we'll go on to consent items, please. Consent items to be approved, Brant County Health Unit correspondence uh, regarding the West Bio <laughs> Nile virus. Uh, Councillor Kyle, you have that? Yes, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Miller that the County of Brant supports local action by the Brant County Health Unit to reduce the risk of West Nile virus. As a result, the County of Brant authorizes any permit application for West Nile virus control submitted to the Ministry of Environment from an appropriately licensed exterminator to apply a larvicide into catch basins or surface waters located within the County of Brant. Any questions? See none called with all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. This takes us to 8.2, which is consent items to be received. Uh, I know Councillor Oakley has one, two, three, four pulled. Uh, eight, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, get it done the fourth. I'll put them on the floor. I'm in a hurry now. <laughs> <laughs> Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Calpine, that items 8.2.1 to 8.2.22 be received as information. Thank you. Uh, I know that we have four that have been pulled, 8.2.8, 8.2.15, 8.2.18, and 8.2.21. Is that it, Councillor Miller? Yeah, uh, 8.2.1 yeah. and 8.2.4. Thank you. Any others to be separated? See, now we're going to vote on everything else. So that's 8.2.2, All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. We're going to go back to Councillor Miller's first because it's at the top of the list. 8.2.1. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, is there anything you can add to what James said in his letter? Because I believe you said on tap, close. Or just a minute. Just a minute here. Let me get it in front of me. He's looking. They're looking to hire an executive director. Oh. They need funds. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't have anything to add to that. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, um, if you need a motion, I'll move a motion. Otherwise, um, could could we ask? There's a um, in light of the um, ruling from MPAC on license operations, changing them to an industrial tax classification. I'm just wondering if we could get uh, something from the treasurer, uh, just talking about the increased taxes that we got through that uh, assessment re review board ruling. Okay. So you're just asking for us to get a report from the treasurer? Well, either that, or I, I, I would take it into the Friday file too. It doesn't matter. Okay. All right. We can do that. Okay. And then uh, eight point two point four. Um, this is, is very frustrating um, because what the uh, Ontario Energy Board has done <laughs> is say uh, where before when they put the uh, pipeline in. If they could justify the capital costs over a four-year period, the project could go ahead. Now they're saying that that has to justify it uh, within the first year. And that was a split decision. Even the uh, province doesn't like it. So uh, the Ministry of Energy is uh, requesting a letter of support. Um, and there's also a conference call. And I'm just one question, and then I, I got a motion on this one. But the question is, is there anybody from staff uh, going to be on that call? Who would be able to answer that? And, and I would have asked Zach, but he's not here at the moment. Allison? Through you, Your Worship, um, we haven't designated any staff to date, but I can certainly make sure the staff is on that call. I would I would gladly volunteer if, if you're okay with that. Um, I, I got enough background. <laughs> I'd be pleased to do it. So, Okay. 
I, yes, I will do it. So Councilor Miller is going to be on the call, and I'll send the letter. Uh, do you want a letter of support? Well, the letter, um, again, that, that's the motion um, that we would have to pass as a council. And uh, I sent it to Alicia. It's on your email because I can't open up Word on my computer. I was wondering if you could read it. Tonight. I haven't, I haven't seen it. It was floating around like um, <laughs> All right, through you, your worship, whereas the Ontario Energy Board issued a split decision which would increase the upfront cost to consumers of installing natural gas connections for new homes and small businesses and could increase the cost of new homes in the province by tens of thousands of dollars, particularly in rural areas, which would limit customer heating choices and energy reliability in communities such as the County of Grant. And whereas the Government's Keeping Energy Costs Down Act 2024 would reverse the OEB's decision and ensure that the province can build new homes and that all Ontario families and businesses can continue to access reliable and affordable energy when it's needed. And whereas the proposed legislation would maintain the existing treatment of gas transmission projects that are critical to the province's economic growth by ensuring new customers do not have to incur upfront financial contributions and update the OEB's leave to construct process to respond to concerns raised by municipalities around supporting critical housing projects and local economic development initiatives. Now therefore be it reserved that the County of Grant supports the Ontario government's proposed legislation to maintain energy affordability and access via the Keeping Energy Costs Down Act, that natural gas must continue to play an integral role in meeting the energy needs of Ontario, that the County of Grant supports the work the Ontario government has done to date, including the natural gas expansion program and electrification and energy transition panels call for a clear policy on the role of natural gas to secure access to affordable energy that this resolution be circulated to the President of AMO, Colin Best, the Honourable Doug Ford, Premier of Ontario, Honourable Todd Smith, the Ministry of Energy, members of Provincial Parliament, all regional municipalities as significant actors to ensuring the need for natural gas in Ontario as part of a measured approach towards energy transition. That's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> so I'll move that, but I, I, I do need a seconder to get on the floor, and I, I can talk to this. Councillor Coleman's your seconder. It just, um, it's pretty innocuous. It's it just, it's saying, yeah, um, again, we've, and we've done it many times around this table. We called for the expansion of natural gas. We know it's the cheapest form of energy going, um, and those that don't have it, particularly in the rural areas, face a, a real disadvantage, an economic disadvantage. So I hope we're supporting it. That's great. Uh, all those in favor, opposed, carried. We might just go back and do 8.2.1. All those in favor, opposed, carried. Thank you. Councillor Oakley, 8.2.8. Uh, .8. So, <coughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I uh, saw this letter from the City of Quint Quinty West, and I would like to move. Uh, seconded by Councilor Bell, or sorry, seconded by no one. Uh, I'm like seeking seconder. Uh, sorry, writing down Anyways, it's been a long evening. Um, therefore, be it resolved that the Council of the County of Brent endorses the resolution from the City of Quinty West, and that the count Council of the County of Brent write a letter of support to the City of Quinty West's resolution and forward this letter to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, Federal Minister for Housing Sean Fraser. Leaders of the Opposition Parties of Canada, MP Pierre Apolyev, MP Jagmeet Singh, and MP Elizabeth May, MP of Brantford Brant, uh, Larry Brock, Cambridge MP Brian May, Oxford MP Art Pankana, Premier Doug Ford, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing Paul Calandra, Leaders of the, of the Opposition Parties of Ontario, MPP Mark Stiles, Bonnie Crombie, and MPP Mike Schreiner, Brantford Brant, MPP Will Bauma, Cambridge MPP Brian Riddell, and Oxford MPP Ernie Hartman. Any questions? All those in favor? It's been seconded by Councillor Bell. Okay, and we're now going down to 8.215. Uh, 
I, you know, it's, yeah. <laughs> Not having to do that. All right. Um, so, uh, similar similar thing to the last one. I thought this was an excellent, excellent initiative that we should support. So, uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councilor Miller, that therefore it be resolved that the count Council of the County Brant endorses the resolution for Lambton County and that the Council of the County of Brant write a letter of support of Lambton County resolution and forward this letter to Premier Doug Ford, Minister of Transportation, Pradmeet Singh Sakaria, leaders of the opposition parties of Ontario, MPP Mark Stiles, Bonnie Crombie, and MPP Mike Schreiner, Brantford Brant, MPP Will Balma, Cambridge MPP Brian Riddell, and Oxford MPP Ernie Hardman. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. 18. Is it exactly the same, Lucas? Yes, this time seconded by Councilor House. Thank you. All those in favor? Thank you. Eight, that was 8.2.18, which takes us to 8.2.21. Is it exactly the same, Lucas? Uh, correct. Seconded by Councilor House. Thank you. All those in favor? Carried. Okay. Committee reports. Planning and Development Committee, Councilor McAlpine. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Howes that the Planning and Development Committee report of March 12th be approved. And I do have a comment for that. You have a which? A, a question. Okay. Before we go on. Okay, go ahead. Okay. So I just wanted uh, our clerk, um, when you move the report into the floor, okay, just ask for the outline of the history of the recommended Foundation number three and what decisions committee has actually made because there was some confusion about that in the papers. So. Madam Clerk, do you want to respond to number three? Through, through your worship to Councilor McAlpine. So with regards to recommendation number three, there were two additional clauses within that recommendation. They were voted on separately. Both of those clauses, which required giving direction to staff, were defeated. Therefore, the only recommendation coming forward from committee to council to consider is that the, the report be received as information and that the engaged grant process continue. Um, this means that other than those two clauses, which I've just read out, the only direction from council to staff thus far is what was given at the November 28th council meeting of 2023, which directed staff to proceed with investigating option three, which was permitting check-ins within all residential areas. Thank you. Questions, Councilor McAlpine? Councilor Kyle? So yeah, more, of a, more of a comment, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Um, as far as the uh, third recommendation here, um, I just think it's uh, worth noting that um, that presentation provided a lot of information to Council, um, some fairly serious information with respect to um, poultry in the, uh, particularly the wellhead areas. Um, I've had a lot of thought about this and it, the status quo with that new information really can't be the answer. Um, in addition to that, there has been a, um, the first confirmation of avian flu for this year. Um, I heard today through my, uh, my day job that they have also now confirmed avian flu cases in dairy cattle south of the border. Um, so that tells us that the virus can sorry, move into uh, different species. So I think the biosecurity concern, which was the original intent of my uh, motion to reopen this discussion in the beginning, has not been addressed. So I'd be remiss if I didn't point that out, that status quo still is not the answer in my opinion. Councillor Oakley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to follow up on, on, on the same concerns as Councillor Kyle, um, myself and, and yourself were present at the um, Brant Federation of Agriculture breakfast the other day, where, uh, which was a fantastic, very um, educational experience for someone like myself who's not too familiar with agriculture. Um, but they too also have a great concern with the chickens that exist roaming free in the wild today in agricultural areas, in rural residential, and in urban areas. And given in light of the implication of the report to our wellhead area, to the biosecurity issue, I, I also feel that, you, that our status quo clearly is insufficient 
we need to pick a lane one way or another. Um, so my understanding is there's going to be a report later on from staff based on the public engagement. So I hope there are solutions presented there. Any other questions or concerns? Okay, so we're just voting to to accept Councilor Calpine's report, noting our concerns. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Uh, Nine point two is the Administration and Operations Committee report. Uh, Councilor Howes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Moved by myself and seconded by Councilor Bell that the Administration and Operations Report of March 19th, 2024 be approved. Are there any questions for Councillor Howes as Vice Chair of Administration and Operations on the report? Seeing none, all those in favor to receive the report? Opposed? Carried. Um, number 10 on the agenda, 10.1, is the arts, culture. Hmm? Well, we already did it. Sorry. That was quick. It's the only thing that's been quick tonight. 10.2, uh, uh, Joint Services Committee Review. Allison has a report for us. Thank you, through Your Worship. Um, I'll, I'll just uh, want to say a few words before I um, answer any questions or go into discussion on this. So, um, it, if you recall, we uh, at our last meeting, there was direction uh, for me to look into the 12 items which were uh, shortlisted by the Joint Services Committee at our initial meeting. Um, I have gone back and looked at those. Um, again, I will, I will clarify only through the lens of our staff and our resources. So this is just uh, from the county point of view. This is without benefit of um, collaboration with the city. And uh, looking for direction tonight, I've grouped the, the uh, 13, 12 initiatives in actually 13 because I'm, I'm suggesting one um, additional, and I think we've, we've covered that earlier tonight, uh, the Intimate Partner Violence be referred uh, to the Joint Services Committee for discussion. So I have grouped those. Um, uh, group A is really referring to initiatives um, that have actually already been initiated by staff. Um, we are currently working on them with um, the staff at the City of Brantford, and um, we feel that these four priorities be, should be removed from the list of priorities for joint services um, because they actually are already underway. If we ever wanted to change reporting structure in the future, we certainly could look at that. Um, group B is are the three initiatives which I am recommending that we um, look at this time through that committee. Um, these are ones that there there um, are valid areas for potential joint ventures. And I will clarify again that um, my interpretation um, in conjunction with staff of what can be achieved in those areas is not necessarily what may be envisioned to the city. So they would require further discussion. Um, and Group C. These are areas where um, I don't believe, given our current resources, budget, and uh, constraints, that we could achieve any efficiencies at this time. Again, it doesn't mean that they can't be brought forward at a, at a later date, but I don't believe there are efficiencies at this time to be had, um, and or there are insufficient resources um, among staff to delve into these further. I will um, also note here that um, there are some areas, not in all, just pick up one, the municipal airport, that absolutely, um, the, the city is further along than the county. Um, they've, they've done significant work just in the past year on the municipal airport. So um, what I'm suggesting is that we look for a proposal to be received from the city on that, given uh, they, at this point, have an idea of how we may or may not fit into that venture. Um, and, and without the benefit of all that background work, um, I think it would be a more efficient process to receive a proposal from the city rather than um, have this examined through the lens of joint services. Um, so I'm happy to answer any further questions, um, but that is a summary of, of how I approach this report. Questions for Allison? Councillor Bell. 
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to Arson. The, the, in Group C, the automated speed enforcement, I'm kind of struggling with that one because we must be struggling with exactly the same kind of issues. Uh, the technology must be common that we can use. There, there must be, I, well, I feel there must be efficiencies in that. Uh, through your worship, so, um, and you're correct, and, and perhaps I should have provided more information on that. So we actually are exploring um, that as a joint venture, so that theoretically could have gone in Group A also. Um, however, my point here is that it's potentially going to be involving other municipalities. So until that determination has been made, um, I didn't want to bring it through joint services because this is something that may be involved, involving other municipalities besides Brantford. Councillor Chambers. Just, just a couple questions uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, the CEO. Um, Using household hazardous waste as an example, the, uh, there was an agreement reached uh, whereby the county is, is working with the city with regard to HHW, as it's uh, called here. And that was initiated uh, independently of the uh, Joint Services Committee. And the route that that took was staff to staff and Lo and behold, it happened. Uh, similarly, uh, I, I understand that similar discussion is taking place with organic staff to staff, uh, public staff to staff, uh, transport staff to staff. And, and I'm wondering, it, it seems that the way to get things done is staff to staff. It, it would seem to me that once you involve a, a 10 member committee to basically deal with things that staff can be dealing with anyway. I'm wondering what, what the purpose of this committee is. Is it a public relations thing where we just uh, join hands and kumbaya with the city uh, and let staff do what they, they do? Or, or can we as a council just direct staff to contact their staff and work on something? Uh, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm seeing that the councillors, the, the politicians are encumbering the process rather than initiating the process at the committee level. So I'm questioning, uh, and I've been on these committees before, so I, I'm, I'm questioning the, the, uh, the existence of the committee. I'm just wondering if perhaps uh, Allison can comment on that. I know it, it would look bad in, in some people's eyes, if the county did not meet with the city and circle the campfire and, and, and be good guys and, and, and uh, do that kind of stuff, but I'm wondering, is it doing any good? Through your worship, um, <laughs> that's a loaded question. Um, Certainly there are things, and, and I suggest in here that there is a, a history with the city of um, making things work because we have many of exa many examples where um, I believe they are success stories and those have happened in absence of this committee. Um, I believe there was intent to, um, and I don't want to speak for, for any of the council um, members on, on this side or that side, um, but I believe the intent was to see if there were other opportunities. Um, can that be done in the absence of a committee? Um, certainly it could. Um, I, you know, with one meeting under our belts, it's hard to say whether that would have taken a different direction um, or would, there would have been um, additional value found out of the committee. Again, it's hard to say having only had one inaugural meeting. Um, what, what I do want to stress to this council is that there are very limited resources within the county right now to take on additional work. Um, so I, I, I approached it maybe a little bit differently than um, the city had envisioned and, and, and certainly the city CAO, and that's not to um, you know, judge the merit or, or not of any of any of these items it's more to look at it in in through the lens of what our resources are and what we can practically actually accomplish this year um, 
and I and I I believe that having a shorter list and looking at a, sh a shorter list of items, maybe with with a much um, more limited scope, uh, would allow us to develop some goodwill on this committee and and some trust and maybe some process where we could maybe look at other initiatives. That being said, um, were the committee not there, would would staff stop speaking to each other and trying to find efficiencies? Uh, no, I don't think that would happen. I think that would happen regardless. I hope that answers your question. Did you, did you have a follow-up, Councillor? Just uh, if it's if it's simply a public relations exercise, there are better ways to join hands and, and pat each other on the back that, than having a committee that uh, sits around in a circle and uh, one side not knowing what their staff is capable of doing or whether the resources are there. Or, and it, it's, it's not an easy way to uh, make progress on significant issues such as household hazardous waste uh, when you can see that that can be done in, in a much a more efficient and economical way in, in terms of staff time and in terms of counselor time. So I, 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 I'm not going to be the one to, to suggest we pull the plug on the committee, but I would certainly be uh, uh, more than happy to uh, uh, stand beside the, the person that would. <laughs> <laughs> counselor Oakley. Uh, through the mayor, I hate to disappoint you, Councilor Chambers. I will not be doing so. Um, I, I do I do see where Council, Council Chambers is coming from, where we are successfully working together on, on a number of things. And, and I think part of the question is who's to say whether or not we're working more or less efficiently doing so. Um, I view this both both as a public relations thing, but also as a strategic conversation. Sure, staff will have organic conversations as it comes up on how to collaborate, but without the our, ultimately we direct staff and without those sort of strategic conversations, things may get missed or it may take longer to do. I think it, to have this conversation when we've had one committee, I think is premature. Um, you know, if this was a year in, two years in, and things weren't moving as quickly as they are now or slowed things down or whatever, then that's the time, the time to have the conversation. The time to have the conversation is not after we've had one meeting, we immediately changed the terms of service because we had noticed some immediate issues and, and we have yet to have a new meeting under those rules. So uh, let's just see where this goes and you know if it's a waste of time in a year then we can all say it's a waste of time and go to a campfire and sing Kumbaya there. <laughs> Councillor Bell? Yeah, thank you Mr. Mayor. Um, Alison, since you, you, you've had a lot of conversation with Brian Hutchings on this, do they have the same perspective that, that um, Councillor Chambers just, just uh, articulated? Through your worship, I, I, I mean, I don't want to speak for them, but that's not my impression. I, I think they're, they're keen to continue the group, to my knowledge. Um, that being said, I, I think where I'm struggling is um, I don't really have any information about what um, the intent is or, or the um, the ideas that they have. I, I think it's, it's very big and high level right now. Um, and that's where I suggested grouping these into ABC and that we, ta we tackle at least a, a minimum one of those at a time. Um, reason being is I think, and again, I, I wouldn't say on all of them, but certainly on the municipal airport, um, I think they have a very clear idea in their mind how we may. And it doesn't mean that that was, you know, without examination, we might not come up with something different, but I think um, in terms of our resources, it would be helpful for us to have a much better idea of what um, at least their idea of the ask is, and that's why I, um, I'm recommending perhaps that we ask for a proposal from that, and then we can enter into a, a meaningful conversation about um, back and forth, what we may want out of that, um, some negotiation, that sort of thing. Um, rather than sort of us starting from a disadvantaged point of view where we haven't, you know, spent a year looking at feasibility of that asset. If I may, Mr. Mayor, one, one more thought. Um, I think many of us have now made the tour of the General Hospital. I think, Brian, you were going to go this week, last week. 
we all came away uh, really concerned. And the concern I have is amplified by the fact that we seem to be traveling a different route, route from uh, the other municipal funder, the city. Their public pronouncements are at odds and different from the ones that we're making. They're thinking behind how we get the province to give us the, enough money to build a hospital is different. And the hospital board is different again. So if there's one item that is really current and important that we should be on the same page on, it would be that one in my mind. And yet it's not in our list. I, I really think we ought to include that. And if we don't sit, do anything else in the next meeting but talk about how we'll address the hospital, not so much how we'll you know, collect funding for it, but how do we make representations to higher levels of government? How do we leverage AMO? How do we work with the hospital board? How do we you know, attempt to deliver something for our collective communities in a reasonable time period? I, I, I think if there's no other reason to have this, this, this committee, that's the one reason in my mind. Councillor Chambers? Could I just, just suggest something that, that and I, I don't disagree with, with Councillor Bell, but if Councillor Bell put that as a resolution, uh, that staff be uh, 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 and maybe throw in the mayor if he wants to go to, to do just that and we all agree then that's done case closed we don't have to go to the city county group to talk about it if that's what we want and that's I think a good idea and I'd second that very uh, thrust to do that and I don't have to go to the city county committee and sit around and slap Dan McCree on the back and shake Carpenter's hand to, to do just that. So, so, and to do it that way takes twice as long as if we waive the, the notice of motion and let Councillor Bell put that on the floor right now, I would second it, we would vote to approve it, and then it would be underway without having to wait two months and three months and four months for it to go through the, 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 the system. That, that's why I, why I say that in, in many ways, the discussion at the committee level is an encumbrance. And that's a perfect example of how it can encumber things. Um, any other comments? I have, I have comments. I have lots of comments. I have tons of comments on this. I think, it's, I think, I think when Councillor Chambers went through the list and said, staff, staff, it worked, staff, staff, it was finished, staff, staff, there was a, you know, it was, it was done. And he just, what he just said makes absolute sense. Make the motion, get a second or put it around, it gets directed to the city and that's the next thing we talk about. Whether we have one meeting or whether we have 10 meetings, why are we prolonging the fact that, that I was so disrespected in a room full of people, 10 people, 10 big personalities, 10 egos, and I was disrespected as the mayor, told that they didn't respect me as a man, or as a mayor, and they didn't like me. That came right out of the blue with no provoke. I didn't provoke that. You witnessed that, Councillor Kyle. It was very embarrassing. So why are we doing that again? Why am I asked to do that again? When Councillor Chambers just told us the way to get things done. We talked about not having the city and the county, uh, you know, the funding that we just did for Nova Vida. Um, why would the county, do, why would the city do that? That's a county thing. Why the hell would the county do anything with the airport? Why, why is the airport on every list that I've ever seen? It's got nothing to do with, it's the same as the Sanderson Center. It's the same as the Gretzky Center. We're happy that it's there, but it's theirs. They own it. It's a department of their city. And why are we talking about the airport when we know that they have a report coming to? They know what they're going to ask us. They're going to want us to probably forgive their taxes. Why should we? Why would we? I'm saying it's gone badly for one meeting. I was told that I was the only negative person in the room and then told that they didn't respect me. Why would my council want me to do that again when I didn't do anything in the first place to provoke it? Any other comments? Councillor Bell. I'm just not quite sure where we've got to here. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling a bit. Um, 
you know, I, I, I can see that we're making progress on many issues without having to meet with them. But there are some where we need a meeting of minds, not of, I, I don't think this, with all due respect to uh, Alison, this is not what CAO to CAO stuff. This should be council to council stuff on things like the new hospital and how we work together on the approach we make through AMO or directly to government. So there are some issues that we should take on. And I'm, if I happily make the motion that the only thing we talk about when we see them is how we jointly go forward on, on getting a new hospital for our collective community. And Councillor Chambers said he would second it. Well, I Councillor Bell. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I can see the, the procedural motion that, that uh, Councillor James is making, but somehow or other, we've got to sit in the same room and talk about it, and we have the opportunity through this committee to be able to do that if we narrow down the focus of it to a very limited number of subjects, and Alison's had a great shot at that. She's got it down, got things off there already. I'd be happy just to talk to that one item and see whether we can make progress on something that's really important to our collective community. And if we can't get that right, then you know, collectively we're not going to get very far. We should leave it to staff. Councillor Bell, at the last um, uh, announcement of, of uh, MPP Valma, uh, I was told that they were going to start from square one with the hospital. That the, the, the information was all sort of all over the place as far as the uh, messaging from the county and the city and I thought Paul Emerson was there and they just said that they needed to start again, that it had it had, it had gotten muddy. So I, I don't know whether, is it there we should be talking about it at the joint services or should we be talking to the hospital board? Well, Councilor Chambers. Just, just to play devil's advocate and, and not to monopolize or rag the puck as they say, but if we went to the committee uh, and, and five of us and, and five of them, and one of them asked any one of us, what is the county's position on the uh, Brantford General Hospital? What would the answer be? Councilor Bell would have an answer. I would have an answer. Uh, the mayor may have an answer. Councilor Kyle may have an answer. And uh, Councilor Oakley may have an answer. But the county doesn't have a position. Councilors have a position. So is, is it the purpose of the committee to to collectively arrive at a position and th that's not the venue for the county to arrive at a position uh, I we may have the same position but I'm not sure that we do and that's why again going to a joint services committee to talk about something uh, we need to have reduction in, in, in the order and, and I don't think we do Councillor Bell and then Councillor Oakley. Well, I think we do have a common position. I think we established it. No, well, I think we established it when we had the budget exercise. We collectively agreed that we weren't going to fund this year. We collectively agreed it is a bigger problem than we can handle. So we start from that position. So how can we work with the city to come to a common position where we move that forward with the people that do have the ability to make this happen? And, and do have an ability to moderate what they're asking of us in terms of funding because it is not, I don't think it's reasonably possible for us to do that. So I think that's the common position I think we have, uh, Robert. And, and that's the position of the county, so we, we, we can present that position in a letter. <laughs> in the, the group dynamic is what I'm getting at, is that that very position can be, be uh, uh, presented to the committee. So that's presented. Okay, thanks for the information. Now next topic. Or is it going to be a discussion? Well, we think maybe this. Or we, is it up to the committee to deviate and massage or change that position? Or do we just say, that's our position? And I think we are obligated to say, that's our position at the committee level because we have not heard any different at this table. So, so these joint committee dealing with things is, is problematic and it's confusing and sometimes it can cause more trouble than it, it, it's, it's worth. But as I oh. said, uh, I've been through this before and I'll, I'll sit at the committee and, and watch it all happen again. 
there, there was more damage done in that one meeting for me in the city of Brantford than my six years on council. And that's the honest to God's truth. I, I've avoided people. People have avoided me since that meeting. Uh, the, the, the bad will that was formed at that meeting is following me. And I'm, I'm just saying that's the truth. Councillor Oakley, then Councillor Kyle, then Councillor Hunt. Uh, through the mayor, just to sort of address the how do we come to a position. We, we already developed a method last time we had this exact same conversation back last October, November, um, which is we go have in camera negotiations and we discuss what we're, what we're going to come to any time we like any time we deal with any organization we come to a consensus or or at the very least vote on something and have a position to go into that uh, we've already determined what we how we were going to approach it last time we did this new information has come forward councillor kyle thanks mr mayor through you um i think since we're a little bit all over the place on this one um, one suggestion that that I might add or um, some thought with respect to the hospital specifically um, I think what I'm hearing is one of the biggest concerns is that our messaging versus the city messaging they're very um, off base as far as what they're saying and what we're saying um, and presenting a united front to other levels of government might be appropriate. So um, perhaps that's a specific topic that we could refer to our government relations committee um, to sit down with a smaller group of folks from the city and have a discussion about the um, how we want to together advocate for the funds we need for the hospital. Separate from how we individually as municipalities are going to come up with our portion. Okay, we're going to go to Councilor House. Uh, the clerk has got a resolution to address the report done by Allison. So well, if, if everyone's finished, I think we, we sort of know where everyone uh, stands. Councilor House, you're going to speak next, and then. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And yeah, and I was heading in that similar direction. Um, and and we can get into long debates about what's the most practical way to, to do this, but I think we've already made decisions about that. And, and, and I do respect that there's probably more practical, efficient ways to do this perhaps, but it is difficult and, and um, it's very unfortunate the experiences that you personally had with this. Um, we do have an opportunity to do some good for our community with in some of these categories and where I was trying to bring us back to is our staff particularly our CAO has put significant time into delivering a report with recommendations and I, th I think we I think that deserves our response like I, I think we need to kind of stay on track um, the, the the recommendations as outlined um, look good to me. I respect our CAO's uh, opinion and vision on this, the details provided. I do agree that um, the future of the BGH needs to appear on some list. <laughs> if, if we're having joint conversations with the City of Brantford, um, we all walked away, I think, sufficiently horrified by the fact that the hospitals held together with duct tape, bubblegum, and hope. Um, and and we, we, we respect that it needs attention, but, but it should be added, I think, to the list in some form. That would be my only other uh, adjustment. Other than that, I, I, I say we take our CAO's recommendation and, and move on. Allison. Thank you, through you, Your Worship. I'll, I'll just mention two things, just because the hospital has been has been brought up a number of times. Um, one, we do have, um, I believe, a rebook date for that delegation to come um, from the hospital and speak to us. So that's good news. Um, we're going to have some better information, and we have met and discussed what I believe um, this council wants to know. Um, talking order of magnitude, costs, and and timelines, and that sort of thing. Um, so that will provide some clarification in terms of how we move forward with funding. Um, what I'm looking for tonight 
is uh, some direction on how I craft a second report. So um, the idea being, and how our terms of reference were, were reframed, is that a report would be sent um, from myself, given council direction, to the Joint Services Committee. So if that is council's will, whether it include the hospital or or not, um, I would you would provide me that direction tonight. I will create a report that will then be sent to that committee. Um, so depending on what council's will is, that's what I will do and whatever you want that content to include. Um, again, I've made my recommendations. If you want to add things to that, I certainly can. Do you want to read the recommendation? Through, through your worship to council. So this recommendation would just be, as Allison just said, in in support of her recommendations. Um, so that report RPT 0168-24, date of March 26, 2024, be received as information and that council directs staff to recommend removing items in group A from the mandate of the Joint Services Committee and that council directs staff to recommend timelines for items identified in group B and that council directs staff to recommend postponing scheduling of items in Group C and that staff be directed to prepare a report to be forwarded to the April 25th, 2024 Joint City County Shared Services Committee for review and discussion. Any interest in that? Councillor Bell and Councillor Howes? Uh, I'll, yeah. I'll second it, I'll, but I do have a question. All right. It, just briefly. So the short answer on this it is shorter list, more intense, more intensity, faster results. Is that correct? Do you want to read it again? No, I'm just, I'm just asking for the kind oh. of interpretation. All right. Through your worship. So in conversations with staff, this is what I see as the most immediate um, scoped items coming out of those sort of umbrella topics that were that were given by the Joint Services Committee. Um, specifically the economic development and tourism, um, talking about there is a need for us to get uh, more benefit from the shared services of the small business center that currently exists. So I have um, no idea at this time if that is what was um, envisioned by the city in terms of economic development and tourism. So that is what the intent of this um, more fulsome report that would go to the Joint Services Committee would be is that that is what I believe those three items that the, there's capacity and resources to address right now. Um, again, it doesn't stop anything else from coming forward at a future date. Um, but that's at this time what I think we can address. Um, what what the city's thoughts on that, I, I don't know at this time. Councillor Hubs. So just the one thing I wanted to highlight is, is I think I think the Group A items and, and basically removing them from the list because they're they're being dealt with staff to staff is exactly what Councillor Chambers was talking about. Um, we're, we're not we're not doing it with everything, but we have have identified already a chunk where where this committee is not adding value. Um, staff to staff can take care of it, um, and then as as things progress, as, as Councillor Oakley pointed out, we've only had a meeting and and work. Um, I, I think this is moving in the right direction. Councillor Bell. Yeah, uh, I can support the motion, but I would like to um, um, amend Group B to include the hospital. Councillor Oakley. I'm just seconding the You're amendment. You're seconding, yes. Councillor. Okay. All those in favor? Putting the hospital on the list? Okay, opposed? Actually, I'm opposed. I was calling the vote. Okay. It passed, didn't it? Yeah. Okay, anything else? Okay, so you we have to vote on we have to vote on the recommendation. Do you want it you want her to read it one more time or are we all right? No, we we're all right. Okay, all those in favor? Opposed? And carried. Okay, 10.3, uh, Cindy, false alarm schedule. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. 
Um, I think the report before council tonight is pretty straightforward. There is a request um, through Police Services Board to make an amendment to the at fault false alarm fees and charges um, in an effort to uh, ensure that our police resources are deployed um, in an efficient manner. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions or concerns? We, uh, we talked about it at police services this morning. Uh, there were no questions or concerns there. Um, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Number 11, communications. We've had a request for someone from Brant County Council to sit on the Brantford Regional Real Estate Association board as a member. Anybody interested? Councilor Miller? Uh, not interested, but the question I want to ask is, <laughs> what benefit is there to, to, to the count, like to, to count? I, I have no idea, Councillor Miller. I'm just reading what the communication said, and I'm presenting it to my council. Yeah, and, and, and they didn't say that. I kind of wish they had. I don't know. Um, does anyone know? No. So I think the ask is for someone from the county to sit on their association. And if there's no interest, we can send them back a letter saying that we put it out there and with the exception of Councillor Garneau and Councillor Pierce, everyone else didn't show any interest. Yeah, Councillor Oakley. I will put my hand up, even though my wife told me to stop signing up for committees. <laughs> Councillor Kyle, <laughs> Councillor Kyle. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Um, yes, Lucas is not supposed to uh, take on anymore, um, but my thought around this one, I, I kind of understand where they're coming from, but I think I would be more comfortable not having a permanent representative on their board and for them to just invite us to come if there was something specific that they wanted to discuss with us. Um, again, looking at it from a government relations committee, I kind of hesitate to, to permanently tie us to advocating with them on something because if at some point we maybe don't agree with the position of the uh, real estate association, um, then that kind of puts us in an awkward position to advocate otherwise. So I, again, I kind of hesitate to commit to something like this. Um, because I think I would much rather be more of an ad hoc if they would like our input on something or if they would like to run their advocacy messages past us to see if there's any we can help them with. I think that's one thing, but I don't think it's necessary necessarily to have somebody on there permanently. Councillor Howes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. I, I agree that that's uh, a sensible approach. The other thing I, I would want to point out if we're responding to them is that the last Tuesday of the month um, for most of us ends up being a very full day like today and and to to ask a member of our council to, to spend an hour or two on a night where they're probably a day where they're probably going to be at council that night it, it the timing is not great so so we we may want to in in alignment with what uh, Councillor Kyle is saying, we may wish to ask them to, to reformat their request. Okay, that's not what's in front of us. We're ask, they're asking for a volunteer, not our opinion on whether we should have someone sit on their association. And right now we have a volunteer in Councillor Oakley. Now, are you, um, Councillor Oakley, are you going to let your name Stand and be a member of their association. Um, the blessing of this council. With, uh, with with respect to Councillor Kyle's suggestion, I will rescind my my. Uh, I I felt it would be it would be rude not to respond with somebody, so someone should put their hand up. But I think that is a better way to approach it. In a later date and time, we should could consider doing something like that. But I think that's the way to go forward. So okay, no. So, so we will send a very respectful letter to the association saying we've had some discussion around the table and right now, because of the timing of the, the, the night and all of what we just said, um, we have no one that wants to sit on their association. 
Yeah. Councillor Howes. But as Councillor Kyle was saying, but that we could have a member attend on occasion yeah. uh, upon specific invitation. That's right. That'll all be in the letter. Yeah. Can I get a motion for that directive? Councillor Oakley, Councillor McAlpine. All those in favor? Thank you. Uh, 11.2, uh, Councillor Garneau's resignation um, from the Committee of the Government Relations, um, which leaves a, a void. Uh, there's three people on that committee. There's myself, Councillor Kyle, and we're looking for someone else. Uh, Councillor Kyle, do you have any suggestions? Is anyone around the table interested <laughs> in, in sitting on that committee? Well... The last one may have also impacted this, but um, I would put forward, if he's so inclined, uh, Councillor Oakley's name to take that open position. This one I did clear, so yes, I'm willing to do so. All right. So does anyone else show any interest in that? Councillor Kyle suggests that Councillor Oakley sits on that committee. Any concerns? All those in favor? Welcome to the committee. Uh, 11.3, the County uh, Brant Public Library Board requests for uh, a creation of a working group. Uh, Allison, you're going to speak to that. Thank you, Three Your Worship. Um, I just wanted to let committee know that I have had um, some discussions with the library. I think there's some um, questions and perhaps mis misunderstandings about process and, and what's next and, and whatnot. Um, so I have offered, and it's been accepted for me to attend the library board meeting tomorrow evening um, as a delegation, so I'm going to be speaking to our status quo, um, where we are in the process. Uh, Mark Maxwell, the project manager, is going to attend with me um, to answer any technical questions. So I would ask committee tonight that this be deferred to the next meeting, because I think it may be able to be resolved tomorrow evening um, as I attend as a delegation rather than striking another committee. Um, if, if the library board is not satisfied, this can certainly reappear in our next agenda. Councillor Hub. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I wasn't present for the meeting where this letter was discussed and craft, crafted, but uh, I am confident that we will uh, um, close the gap in some of the perceived communication gaps uh, tomorrow night, and uh, I move that we defer any further action on this letter to a future meeting. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move by myself, second by Councillor Kyle. Um, I'll leave out the whereas in the operative causes clauses. Therefore, that April 2nd, 2024 is hereby declared uh, World Autism Day in the County of Brant. And I'm grateful that uh, the clerk picked me to present it. Uh, I just had my nephew over on Sunday for dinner and he has autism. So very familiar with uh, the effects of that. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. This takes us to number 13, other business. We had two. We had Councillor Miller and Councillor Kyle, wasn't it? Councillor Miller, you want to go first? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll be brief. Um, I just want to note, um, I'm quite sad uh, to get uh, Alicia's email regarding, uh, or, uh, regarding Pat Newstead's uh, passing. Uh, Patrick served for years on the Accessibility Committee. I was on it for 10 years. He was on it the whole time I was on it, and uh, he was on it several years before that. So I'm not even quite sure how long he sat on that. He did sit on other committees. Um, I just want to say about Patrick, um, I think only a handful of people uh, fully appreciated uh, Patrick's abilities, and I think that's because of his obvious disabilities. But, uh, you know, he, he, had a, uh, he had a subtle sense of humor. Um, he brought a lot to the committee. Um, I mean, he lived it every day, and, and I don't know how many times I sat at the committee, and he would say something, and I thought, well, that's a really good point, Patrick. I'd never seen that. So um, I, he, Patrick did a lot for the community, and, and, and I'm grateful we sent some flowers. But, Mr. Mayor, um, I'd like to move a motion that uh, 
the county do up uh, maybe a certificate of appreciation for his years of service and um, there is a celebration of life for Patrick I believe it's April 14th it's someday in April at the um, the, the Legion here in Paris and uh, if, if you want to deliver it that, that'd be great to, it, or I would deliver it um, it's up to you but uh, anyways I'm going to put that motion on the field yeah, Councillor Coleman is the seconder for that and I will be there to present the uh, all those in favor those thanks Councillor Miller Councilor Kyle. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I'll be brief as well. Um, just wanted to draw uh, Council's attention to an invitation that we received a couple of weeks ago via Spencer from the uh, Brant Egg Awareness uh, Committee with respect to the Bite of Brant. It's the 29th annual Bite of Brant happening this year in Burford, April 9th and 10th. Um, they have extended a, um, an invitation for any of the councillors that are interested to go and have a tour of the event. Um, it is quite something to see. They, they host over a thousand grade five students over the course of the two days. Um, they follow sort of a, a pizza theme that walks them through the different uh, commodities that can create a pizza and then, and then some. They've got lots of extra stuff too to create the whole meal. Um, but it is, it is something that's really good to see, so I would especially encourage um, those of our council members that are from a more urban background to maybe take some time to go down and uh, check it out. And Jean Emmett, I'm sure, will happily tour anyone through that um, is able to come. Uh, cause they're, they're very proud of the event. Um, it takes, it's, it's not easy to have an event like that go for almost 30, 30 years. So. Um, that's just a little note I wanted to put out there, um, that if you can get there, make sure you go and check that out. Yeah, it's a great event. Allison. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, through you, I, I just want to say very briefly um, before we go in camera, I want to acknowledge um, that it's our general manager of corporate services birthday today. And um, I apologize, this is how you spent your birthday, but um, I did want to acknowledge that, that she she made it here tonight, so thank you, Heather. Uh, which takes us to number 14 in camera. Councillor Coleman, you're going to take us in camera. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Moving by myself, second by Councillor Kyle, that the County of Brant Council convene in camera to discuss labor relations mandate to bargain. All those in favor? We're moving into count camera.
Thank you. The next thing on the agenda is number 15, the bylaws. Councillor Howes, you have the bylaws? Kidding. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Oakley that bylaw 25-24 to 27-24 be read a first time. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried? Could you read them for the second time, please, Councillor House? Thank you. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Oakley that 25-24 uh, to 27-24 be read a second time and all clauses and preambles be adopted. Are there any questions to the second reading of the bylaws? Seeing none, all those in favor? Okay, if we could do a third reading, please. Thank you. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Oakley that bylaw 2-24 as amended 25-24 to 27-24 be read a third time, passed, signed, and executed. Councillor Miller? Yeah, I have an uh, amendment, Mr. Mayor, for that third reading. Yep. So it's moved by myself, second by Councillor Coleman, that the following clauses be added to bylaw 2-24. That the decisions of the Court of Revision dated February 27, 2024, form part of this bylaw schedule B and that the report prepared by R.J. Burnside & Associates Limited dated December 2023 and attached here to a Schedule A is hereby adopted, subject to the changes approved by the Court of Revision at the recommendation of the engineer for drain A, B, and the Northeast drain. All those, are you, everyone's good with that for the third reading? All those in favor? Opposed? Carried? Which takes us to the end of the agenda. Next meeting is Tuesday, April the 9th, uh, immediately following planning and development. I do believe we did a lot of good work for the County of Brant tonight. We got there in very difficult ways, but I do believe everything we did tonight was for the betterment of the county. Uh, motion to adjourn. Councillor Oakley. Haven't you had enough, Councillor Oakley? Get me oh, out of here. We stand adjourned. <laughs>